The February 2022 issue features articles that define systemic and structural racism, explain how these forms of racism damage health, and propose how to dismantle racist systems and structures. The issue will delve into more specific topics, such as the impact of structural racism on the employment of Black women in the U.S. healthcare labor force, how racial bias among physicians creeps into what is communicated in electronic health records, and how experiences of racism impact reproductive care, use, and experiences. Find this and more at healthaffairs.org. Hello, I'm Alan Weil, Editor-in-Chief of Health Affairs. We're proud to have released yesterday the February issue of Health Affairs, Racism and Health. And I actually have a physical copy, which I haven't touched in about two years of physical copy of Health Affairs. It's so nice to have it in my hands. We're also so pleased to be able to have today's briefing, which draws from many of the papers in the issue. Now this issue does a lot of things. First and foremost, of course, it includes the traditional high quality peer reviewed empirical scholarship on racism and health that is what readers of health affairs expect. But we also stretched in a number of important ways that are reflected in the contents. The issue includes four overview papers to orient the reader to the robust evidence base regarding the effects of racism on health and a longstanding resistance to examining health policy and health outcomes through the lens of racism. The issue includes more than our usual number of qualitative papers, because one aspect of racism is erasing those who are not in power. For example, grouping people under the label other in quantitative analyses and thereby effectively eliminating their voice. The issue includes a history of racism and its effects on health in the District of Columbia because one of the most effective ways to tell the story of racism is to identify specific places, institutions, and laws that have racist origins and have lasting racist effects. And today we released a full-length video interview of award-winning author Harriet Washington, whose groundbreaking book, Medical Apartheid, shifted our understanding of racism and health and was pivotal in shaping the career choices of many who were first exposed to the reality and horror of what racism has meant for the lives of Black Americans when they read her book. The issue also signals to the broader health services research field the importance of racism as a legitimate, indeed a necessary area of study and our commitment to continuing to publish scholarship on the topic. And the issue is situated in the larger context of our work to promote a more equitable academic publishing environment. So now I want to give you a quick preview of the day. You'll be hearing from Dr. Rich Besser, President and CEO of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, followed by an original poem read by Sharon Adipo Dorku, which is published in the Narrative Matters section of the February issue. Following her, you'll hear from Secretary of U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Javier Becerra, and then we will turn to four panels each of which I'll introduce in turn, there will be a break between the second and third panel. The first two panels will really frame the issues and the last two panels will go into some of the more specific empirical findings. Now this event is just one of many ways we're engaging with you on the topics published in the racism and health issue. I've already mentioned the video interview. There are so many more resources, events, podcasts, and more, you can find them all at our landing page at healthaffairs.org slash racism and health. Before we move to the content, I do want to acknowledge the financial support that was necessary to make this issue briefing and so many of the other activities we're engaging in possible. We were supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the California Wellness Foundation, the WK Kellogg Foundation, the Episcopal Health Foundation, and the New York State Health Foundation. We were guided by our theme issue advisors, Drs. Rachel Hardiman and Jose Figueroa, who you will meet shortly, and by our theme edit issue editor on our staff, uh, Jessica Bylander. And now let's move into the program. I'm going to begin by introducing to you Dr. Richard Besser, President and CEO of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, a position he has held since April of 2017. Dr. Besser is former acting director for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, serving from January to June 2009, during which time he led the CDC's response to the H1N1 influenza pandemic. 
He was ABC News' former chief health and medical editor, where he provided medical analysis and reports. He is a leading voice on the importance of health equity, advocating for racial justice, the full inclusion of people with disabilities, and a COVID-19 response and recovery that prioritizes those who have been most affected. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Richard Besser. Uh, thanks so much, Alan. It is truly an honor to, to join you today for, for this important symposium in conjunction with the release of the special health affairs issue on racism and, and health. Uh, the research is clear. Uh, black and brown people in America live shorter lives, receive inferior health care services, and experience worth, worse health outcomes than white people. Uh, many here today have done important research and work focusing on advancing uh, uh, equity in healthcare and the goal of providing everyone with a fair and just opportunity to thrive. Documenting health disparities has been part of health services research for, for many, many years, including research with the, which the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has initiated, funded, and reported, and, and we're proud of that. Uh, but increasingly, we recognize a critical need in our work to shift from a focus on disparities to looking at the inequities that create those disparities. To do this, we must explicitly address the myriad ways in which structural racism underlies so many inequities. These inequities privilege some and disadvantage others, especially by race. Our vision at the foundation for a culture of health in America, it recognizes that health is a result of what takes place in communities, where we live and work, and where our children learn and play. It's also connected to what takes place in our healthcare systems. We know that we will never achieve this vision without confronting and working to end structural racism in our healthcare systems, including the ways in which it permeates the policies, practices, and norms that guide these systems. At the foundation, we know that anti-racism has to be part of everything we do. As the scholarship and research in this month's Health Affairs makes plain, the history of individual and structural racism in our nation's healthcare system spans generations. Racism in our healthcare system has limited people's access and opportunity. It's denied access to quality, respectful care. It has impacted physical and mental health, and it's robbed people of their dignity. Together, we can transform these systems so they truly support health, healing, and thriving for all people, especially those most profoundly affected by racism, other forms of discrimination, and historic trauma. It's a call to action that none of us can ignore. That's why I'm heartened to see that a publication as influential as Health Affairs has committed to advancing knowledge about health equity and why I deeply appreciate the contributions of all the authors in this month's issue. It's our privilege to be one of the supporters of this important research. I wanna thank you for being part of the solution and I look forward to the discussions ahead. And I wanna thank everyone for joining and for participating. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rich. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Sharon Adipo Dorku, Principal at Tertia LLC and Senior Service Fellow at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, who's going to read her original poem, which was published in our February issue. The poem is entitled, Identity. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Since I hold the belief that our uh, our accomplishments are immeasurable with our support systems. I have some quick acknowledgements to shout out first. Much gratitude to the theme advisors and health affairs for the vision behind this incredible work. Thank you to all my loved ones, friends, family, peers, mentors, and colleagues who are both here physically and in spirit for their immeasurable gra grace and support. My ever loving God for the bountiful gift bestowed to me to be able to stand here in this moment. I'm thankful to my ancestors whose shoulders I stand on, grandparents who always saw to it that I dream big beyond my circumstances, parents who did not interfere in my path of exploration, my ride or die husband, Terrence, my heartbeats, Deidre, Sylvester, and Sebastian. It is truly an honor to share my work. And as I read these words, I hope we're all moved to begin to see our humanity in all of its intersectional facets and a recognition of the importance of how each of us walk in our various identities. As exemplified by myself with this traditional Ghanaian attire. Additionally, as we are in Black History Month, let's be aware of the work we still have to do in this nation as HBCUs are receiving bomb threats and our Black sisters and brothers are still dying 
prematurely. Here I go. Identity. Birth in the plains of Tema, in the land of gold and cocoa, surrounded by love of all proportions, acquainted with challenges of survival, seeing the haves and the have-nots, observing a societal structure of class, getting lost in the narrative of leaders, leaders who are my treasured ancestors, leaders in the liberation of Black people, Jubilating in the richness of the Black experience, I thrived in my home. Building dreams I wanted to see, hearing about other worlds far, far away. Never understanding how they differed, differed in experiences lived by others like me. I travel now to the United States, a curious talkative turned into a quiet soul, struggling to understand my experiences with less recognition of my identity craving for a sense of belonging called home, the feeling of loss and connections, tirelessly trying to build new ones, the confusion of the Black experience, completely different from mine. The trauma of being told by whiteness, my African identity made me elite and seeking to bury it all in academics. It did become very evident, however, statistics did not account for my heritage when generalizing Blackness as a monolith because the racist philosophies were deeply rooted in systems within the inequities that I now navigate. Systems with white supremacy at core, never a regard for how it tore down my home through colonialism, enslaving my brothers and sisters, a black African in the diaspora, is by its own accord, my identity. One filled with richness and heritage, one filled with culture and beauty, one filled with oneness with others, stolen from their homes, not by choice. Now together we fight, arm in arm. With resiliency, we face our trauma, dismantling the structures that abound as anti-racism warriors to yield a world of hope we see for us and generations to come. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And uh, again, to the audience, you can see it in print in the February issue, but we're so appreciative of your participation in the program today. Thank you so much. It's, it's now my great privilege to introduce to you our keynote speaker, Javier Becerra, the 25th Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services. Before becoming the first Latino to hold the office of HHS Secretary in the history of the United States, Secretary Becerra served 12 terms as a member of the U.S. House of Representatives. As a member of the Ways and Means Committee, Secretary Becerra introduced the Medicare Savings Programs Improvement Act of 2007 and championed provisions of the Medicare Improvements for Patients and Providers Act of 2008. He was one of the original co-sponsors of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, other words known as the Affordable Care Act, now the law of the land. As Attorney General of the State of California, Secretary Becerra focused on price competition in the health sector, took early action in the pandemic to protect workers from exposure to COVID-19 and secure key safeguards for frontline healthcare workers' rights. He was a leader in the federal court fight to defend the Affordable Care Act. Secretary Becerra, thank you for your service to the country and for joining us today. It's my pleasure to turn the microphone over to you. Alan, thank you very much, and to Health Affairs for devoting this much attention to an issue that's so important in our country. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be with you alongside so many partners in this fight uh, that is so indispensable for us to make progress and to close those gaps in healthcare that we've seen over the decades and certainly as a result of this pandemic have become glaring. Dr. King uh, famously called injustice in health the most inhumane and shocking form of inequality. And as I just mentioned, the past two years of this pandemic have really underscored the inequality in brutal detail, especially for communities of color. Uh, you probably already know this, many of you, but COVID-19 has killed Black Americans, Latinos, and Indigenous Americans at two times the rate of white Americans. And, and Further evidence suggests that Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders are three times more likely to contract COVID-19 compared to white people and nearly twice as likely to die from the disease. Beyond this pandemic, 
health and equity continues to put our most valuable resource, our human beings, uh, at risk. So without any hesitation, I think we can all say we can and we must do more and we must do better. That's why at HHS, we're putting equity at the core of everything we do. In the last year, we've made vaccines free and widely available to all Americans. We issued guidance for improving access to COVID-19 vaccines so that no matter your zip code, no matter your background, if you're eligible, there's a vaccine there in reach for you. Our public, uh, public affairs division continues to engage people in hard to reach communities. We quadrupled the number of people that are available to reach folks who are trying to access health insurance coverage through the Affordable Care Act. We established a network of some 17,000 plus volunteers, including over a thousand physicians to help boost vaccine confidence. And to date, our public health education campaign has released some 1,500 ads in more than 14 different languages. We've invested over $7 billion in community health centers, which have administered nearly 19 million vaccines, two thirds, more than two thirds of those administered to racial and ethnic minority patients. And since 2021, we've invested $18 billion for provider relief funds to support COVID mitigation across rural pockets of the country. All of this work has paid dividends. As of today, well, let me, let me put it this way. Back in May, when I had been in for about a month or so, I was being shown data that was displaying that some two thirds of Americans at that point, adults, had received at least one dose of the COVID vaccine. Uh, for Black Americans and Latinos, the numbers were below 55%. So uh, a significant gap between white America and black and brown America when it came to uh, getting vaccinated. Well, the numbers I was given at the beginning of this year uh, showed that at that point, white Americans, at least one vax, uh, vaccine in arm, uh, some 82, 83%, black Americans, about 82, 83%, and Latinos, about 84% a dramatic change for communities of color that are often neglected. We have done some really hard work to reach all communities and to deal with the disparities that we see often caused by racism. And we're gonna to continue to do more because we know that this is something that pervades our healthcare system. And the Biden-Harris administration has made it a priority to center equity in our COVID-19 response and in all we do on healthcare. Beyond COVID-19, we've also expanded healthcare access for millions of Americans. I mentioned how we have quadrupled the number of people that have been trying to reach out to those who are uninsured to get them enrolled in the Affordable Care Act's uh, marketplace coverage. Uh, we had tremendous success. Uh, thanks to the additional resources that were made available through the American Rescue Plan, millions of lower and middle income families of color enrolled in health insurance marketplace uh, plans and they saw their premiums lowered or eliminated. Uh, some four in five Americans who went onto our marketplace website found a health insurance plan of quality coverage for $10 or less per month. Uh, try going to see a movie in any cinema today for $10 or less for one movie. Uh, compare that then to full months of coverage for a premium of $10 or less a big difference. And the greatest thing about that is that some 14 and a half million Americans took us up on the offer, went onto the website, got health insurance coverage. Many of those new time enrollees, some 6 million of those 14 and a half million were Americans who didn't have health insurance coverage before. So they weren't just re-enrolling again. They were new Americans getting covered. That's a record for the number under the Affordable Care Act. So we feel very good about what we've seen happen with the Affordable Care Act's coverage and people's participation in our open enrollment, which again, with all the extra outreach, we were able to connect with folks and show them they can get a great plan for a great price. Beyond that, Medicaid, Children's Health Insurance Program, well, we saw uh, the enrollment in those two programs reach a record 82 million Americans, the largest increase 
in, the, in those programs history now receiving coverage as a result of the work that's been done by the president and the, the help through the American Rescue Plan. Uh, I also wanna mention how we're so very proud of the work we've done to improve maternal health outcomes, especially among black and indigenous mothers. Uh, my wife, Carolina, who is a high-risk OBGYN, a perinatologist, has often said to me how important it is that we do more for women who are getting ready to deliver, but including after they deliver for mom and for baby. And that's what we're doing now. We're devoting our attention and resources to help some of those mothers because we know the outcomes for black mothers and indigenous mothers sometimes are two to three times worse leading to death in many instances uh, where you leave a child without a mother, not when something we're willing to see. And that's where I think uh, I can get a lot of good kudos from someone like that OBGYN who's been with me for over three decades. I'm proud to say that at HHS, we're doing the work that counts for everyone, not just those who can reach us, but for everyone every single day. We've invested hundreds of millions of dollars and approved extensions of care, uh, postpartum care coverage for a number of families and as, as, certainly, of course, women in a number of states who have taken us up on the offer to increase the extended care that you get under Medicaid for postpartum delivery. Uh, Illinois, Missouri, Georgia, New Jersey, and Virginia have now extended their 60-day coverage under Medicaid for a woman who delivers to a full 365 days. We're doing that under Medicaid because we know it not only will save lives, but it will mean great health outcomes in the future for mom and baby. This is critical. We're not going to stop. And we hope others will take advantage of that as well. I want to make sure that I mentioned as well that there are some, oh, is it uh, 700,000 700, plus individuals who will benefit by the expanded postpartum coverage. Uh, that includes some 220,000 uh, women of Latino descent and over 130,000 African-American women uh, who will benefit from this. That is game changing for all those mothers, importantly for their babies. We're also fighting equity in other areas. We've established this new office of climate change and health equity to protect vulnerable communities from climate disasters. We're funding the Indian Health Service in record numbers to live up to our tribal obligations. We're investing in childcare and early childhood education to prepare the next generation of American leaders. And we've established the White House Initiative on Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islanders to promote equity and fight back against the horrific anti-Asian racism that has become rampant during the pandemic. So to close, I'm deeply proud of the program uh, and the progress that you see today out of HHS, but I also know we have our work cut out for us. We're not done. We will continue to be vigilant in our fight to advance the health and well being of all Americans. We will continue to fight to pass the Build Back Better agenda, and we'll keep making equity and justice our North Star because we know healthcare is about more than just mending bones or dispensing pills, it's about giving people access to peace of mind, to economic security and to a brighter future. And that should belong to everyone, no matter where you come from, what your color, what language you speak. We think all Americans have that opportunity and that's how we build back better. We look forward to doing this with you. I thank Health Affairs for giving me this opportunity. Alan, I turn it back over to you. Thank you, Secretary Vistera. Thank you so much for joining us in our efforts today. We're really honored by your presence and appreciate your comments. Uh, we're now going to move into four panels that will round out the rest of our afternoon here on the East Coast. Uh, the first panel is uh, drawn from four overview papers that we have in the February issue. We don't typically have four overview papers, but this topic really lends itself to a scholarly uh, uh, understanding and underpinnings of uh, why this topic uh, warrants attention and what we've learned uh, thus far. Our panelists are Dr. Uh, Ruth Enid Zambrana at the University of Maryland College Park, Dr. Paula Braveman at the University of California, San Francisco, Dr. Jose Figueroa at Harvard University, and Dr. Rachel Hardiman at the University of Minnesota. And as I mentioned earlier, Drs. Figueroa and Hardiman were 
our two theme issue advisors. They were major contributors to the success of this issue beyond uh, their, the contribution of the papers that they wrote. Uh, we have uh, time for a nice conversation, but I think it's important for us to start with sort of the short uh, version of what you covered in each of your papers, which I think will uh, help situate uh, the, uh, the, the time that we have to discuss in a more holistic way. Um, Dr. Zambrana, I'm going to start with you. Um, and the question I hope you can just spend a couple of minutes on as you introduce your paper is this uh, contrast and similarities between clinical medicine's approach and historical understanding of race and racism and the social sciences and health services research understanding of the role of race and racism and how they have been separated, but uh, maybe uh, we would gain something by bringing them uh, together. So I'll kick it off first to you. Mm, good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me. I think clinical medicine and social science have had different approaches historically of looking at what occurs in a person's life and how that affects their health and other social indicators. I would also say in our paper aim to really examine both the social sciences and clinical medicine historically, and to look at their understanding of different groups. So race as a biological construct and one that was a marker for intellectual inferiority was prevalent in both of the sciences. I think that was in the 18th century, um, early 19th century, even up to the early 20th century. The biomedical models tended to look at the individual body and at a one cause um, factor to determine the health outcome, to determine cardiovascular disease, to determine diabetes. I think in the early 20th century, as we point out in our paper, particularly pro-1980s, we got a different understanding that many factors influence health, that poverty influences health, that um, salary income influences health, that socioeconomic differences did make a difference in how people lived at the Roy Wood Johnson Foundation, how they lived, where they worked, um, the, the interactions they had. We still have a bit of a way to go, I think, for social science and clinical medicine to come together. But we have epigenetics. So we have a number of fields that have combined interdisciplinary knowledge of sociology, of psychology, of anthropology, environmental sciences that have begun to shape, I believe, both the paradigms in clinical medicine and the marriage between clinical medicine and the social sciences. We still have a long way to go, but I think we have that initial period that we hope will continue to build on what we have learned. Well, we'll certainly talk about that some more as we go on through this panel. Uh, I do wanna turn next uh, to Dr. Paula Braveman. Um, your piece, uh, frames the concepts of structural, institutional, systemic racism, uh, an area you've been working on for quite some time. I wonder if you could provide uh, one or two examples so people have a more uh, uh, grounded understanding of what those concepts mean, but also begin to trace the, the line between those structures and systems and the health outcomes uh, that uh, where we see so many disparities today. Well, I will, <clears throat> I will try to do that. Um, you know, when most people think about racism, that they think about, um, they think about hate crimes and they think about name calling, uh, or they think about slavery or Jim Crow. Um, uh, but they don't think about uh, they don't think about what's in the ongoing structures. And um, by structures, I'm referring to the laws, the policies, 
the entrenched uh, institutional practices, the in entrenched beliefs, you know, what it is in these ongoing institutions that systematically puts black and brown people at a disadvantage. Um, uh, there's a, a, a wonderful, um, uh, a wonderful schematic developed by uh, uh, Professor um, uh, G at, uh, at UCLA uh, and, uh, and his colleague Roe. And it, it shows racism as an iceberg. And the tip of the iceberg is the part of the racism that most people think about. It's the, the in-your-face interpersonal, um, um, but the far more dangerous part of the iceberg is below the surface, and you don't see that. And that's what that's what that's what's deadly, and um, what it consists of uh, are our laws and policies and um, uh, and and very very entrenched practices. And beliefs. Just to give one example, um, racial residential segregation. Um, racial segregation systematically puts people of color at a profound disadvantage in in many many ways, but including economically. Um, the services are poor. There's uh, and partly because of, of unfair lending practices, which would be another example of, of, uh, of uh, structural or systematic, uh, systemic racism. Um, because of unfair lending practices, uh, you're going to have lower property values in a, um, <clears throat> in a segregated community. And so there's going to be lower funding for the schools. That's in, in most states. There are some states that have that have taken measures to equalize equalize that, um, but uh, our residential segregation goes along with profound economic deprivation, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and it it happens uh, even if you don't need even one single individual who's intending to discriminate to have it happen that. It was mandated by Jim Crow laws, racial residential segregation was, and the patterns have persisted. And as a society, we have not done what we need to do to, to break it down. Um, and, uh, and so I, I think we have had too much emphasis. The one reason that I've been very interested in, in systemic racism or structural racism. So I think we've had too much emphasis in, um, in proposed solutions. We've had too much emphasis on uh, doing something about individuals, you know, individuals who are behaving badly. Um, and, and we're missing the mark because it's, it's not in the individual. More and more and more individuals will keep coming because the the, the structures are, are there. And the way, I mean, you also asked um, how, uh, uh, how health is damaged. I mean, there's through many, many pathways. One is, um, uh, you know, we, we have centuries of evidence of the role of economic disadvantage in, in health. Um, and, uh, and so uh, segregation and uh, residential segregation and uh, discriminatory lending uh, and uh, uh, these schools dependence on uh, property taxes, uh, giving kids of color uh, under-resourced schools, all of those are going to lead to economic, um, to economic uh, disadvantage. Uh, structural racism also disadvantages people, it leads to poor health, uh, not necessarily through economic disadvantage, but it can directly through interpersonal uh, interpersonal racism. And if there's time, I'd love to um, talk about that more, but don't want to take up more too much more time now. But we know from neuroscience how stress 
Now we know how stress influences health and specifically chronic stress is what's so toxic. Um, uh, and so the chronic stress of being exposed to, uh, to racism, yeah, even if it's, it's, uh, if it's innuendos and it's not completely, um, not completely uh, overt, you know, that stress, there, there's a, there is a, a very large literature now that has accumulated that has uh, uh, connected experiences, racial experiences. Um, racial, racial discrimination with stress. And this is not just among people, uh, people of color of low income. In some ways, what the literature shows is that it's the people of higher income, higher, uh, uh, higher education levels, um, the people of color of, of higher uh, SES, uh, who uh, actually may experience more racial discrimination. So there are many pathways, and I'll end there. Okay, uh, thank you for uh, laying that out for us. Ed, you mentioned uh, residential discrimination. It makes me think, Dr. Hardman, your paper focuses on the importance of measuring racism, and one of the examples you give is around residential segregation. Um, I wonder if you could just sort of take that topic and go into some of the, what is it we need to know? We know residential segregation exists. Uh, we know it has historical roots in policy. Uh, if we're trying to expand our understanding of the tie between racism and health, what are the next steps on that topic? Sure. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to participate um, on this panel and also to serve as a theme issue. Um, editor for for the the special issue it's been an honor um and and frankly it's i feel like we've produced a um uh an issue or a journal issue that is what i wish to have been able to read right when i was um a young scholar and so i'm really thrilled about that and um you know so alan as we think about the premise of the paper that um that my team published that i think one of the important things first to note is that our work is multidisciplinary. And so it comes from the disciplines of health services research from decision science, um, sociology, as well as social epidemiology. And I think it's important to note that as we think about, you know, what we just heard um, others on the panel discuss, because it is going to take a multidisciplinary lens to do this work. And, you know, the premise of our paper is that um, we have to develop sound measures of structural racism. And that's, that that in, in, its, in and of itself is an urgent public health issue. Um, so when we think about residential segregation or racial residential segregation, which has been sort of the measure of structural racism for a very long time and has um, advanced the field in significant ways as we understand where one lives um, and the policies that um, dictated where one lives and how that matters for health. But what our paper does is really um, ask um, scholars and policymakers to go beyond that point to really think about what does it actually look like to um, develop measures of structural racism? Um, and how do we and how do we do that? So we are you know, aiming to outline the method methodological approaches that will help to move that field of research forward. Um, so part of that is understanding the historical context. So um, being able to measure the role that redlining played in racial residential segregation and how that's dictated, for instance, who has been at greater risk for COVID-19 over the past two years. Um, we also highlight um, the role that uh, geographical context in other ways plays um, in, in um, measuring structural racism. And we propose some really promising, I think, uh, future directions for that work. So really thinking both about how do we ensure that the work is community led, um, ensuring that the folks who are closest to the pain of structural racism are dictating how it's measured and thinking about and shaping um, how those data are, are used as well, but also thinking about, um, you know, what is the multifaceted nature of structural racism? So we know that racial residential segregation is one piece of it, but how does that under, um, intersect, right, with um, uh, structural racism as it manifests in education or employment or in these other domains, and how do we capture that multi-dimensional, um, um, that multi-dimensionality in a way that allows us to create an informed policy that uh, that is effective, that doesn't have unintended consequences uh, down the line. So I look forward to the discussion and thanks for having me. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Figueroa, I wanna bring you in. Your paper 
reminds us that uh, racist policies are still very much in place and policies with racist origins continue to shape health policy in the United States. Um, maybe you could just kick us off with a few examples of that so people understand uh, how that's playing out still today. Sure, uh, thank you so much for inviting me. And, and again, it was a pleasure to serve as a co-advisor with Rachel on the issue. I wanna just say, I appreciate everything you guys do. It was one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. Picking papers for this issue was so hard. I don't know how you guys do it every day. I lost a little bit of sleep, I felt stressed. Lots of great scholars out there, lots of young great scholars as well. And, and, and we're happy with the issue, but again, God bless you for the work you guys do every day. It was, it was quite hard. Uh, the second thing I'd like to say is I want to acknowledge my co-authors on the, on the paper, uh, Professor Rukeja Yerbi and Professor Bree, Bree Clark, who are both outstanding legal scholars and also you know, real, the, the real thought leaders behind the piece. And, and I, I loved working with them. Uh, so, so as you mentioned, the paper we, we wrote was really focused on trying to provide a historical and modern account of how structural racism is embedded in U.S. healthcare policy, which is basically all of the decisions, the goals, the actions that happen at the local, the state, and the federal level that determine the rules of the game, how healthcare is administered, and, and who gets covered, how do they get that coverage, who pays for it. And importantly, access, if they have it, access to what? And, and quality of care becomes a big issue. And so really the three areas that, that were the primary focus around was how structural racism was embedded in policies related to healthcare coverage, healthcare financing, and then again, quality of care. And then the big theme, which I think many have written about uh, in the piece, uh, in the special issue is that Many of these policies were well-intended. Some of them were quite neutral in their nature. Um, people are increasingly calling these colorblind policies, which means they don't take the social circumstances of the individuals that these policies eventually target. And we argue that it is be precisely because of that reason that we see many of the health inequities today. So I'll just give a couple of examples uh, on healthcare coverage, uh, Medicare and Medicaid, it is the safety net in terms of healthcare coverage that we have for older adults, uh, a lot of them people of color, and then low income adults uh, and children disproportionately more likely to be people of color as well. Uh, but in this country, we've made a lot of decisions that, give, that gave a lot of the authority, for example, to states to figure who should, uh, who, who would qualify for Medicaid, for example, in, in the in Medicaid expansion. And there's 12 states currently that have decided not to expand Medicaid. You dig a little deeper into it. A lot of the state legislatures argue that there's not enough evidence to support expansion, even though there's hundreds, literally hundreds of paper, paper showing the benefits of Medicaid expansion, especially uh, on, the, on the health of low-income people of color. Uh, and, and, in, in, and then when you look at it even a little bit deeper, you find that it is Decisions to expand Medicaid are purely driven by the support of white populations in the state and not correlated at all with the support of the black and Latino populations in the state. Uh, another example is implementation of work requirements. Uh, as we know, for, for centuries, for uh, black Americans work ethic has been questioned. And it is, it is a marker of, of, of racism that traces back to the days of, of slavery. Uh, and, and we highlight how work requirements are really a marker of uh, structural racism in, in coverage as well. On issues of quality, I'll just give one more example, is in recent years, there's been a uh, huge effort to, to increase accountability of the healthcare providers uh, deliver, and that's by increasing accountability through value-based care. Value-based care was all in the name of improving quality and lowering cost and, and thus improving value of care. But as we know, there's been over 20 programs that have come out of CMS, most of them through the ACA, uh, and none of them really, except maybe a couple now, accounted for the social circumstances of the patients that were being served by healthcare providers. And that unfortunately led to 
uh, disproportionate burden of penalties across the board for safety net providers taking care of more Black and Latino people, which uh, in some cases, those penalty programs were uh, zero-sum programs, where the penalties were taken away from a lot of the Black-serving hospitals and the Latino-serving hospitals and given as bonuses to hospitals predominantly serving uh, white populations. And those are just some examples. We cover a lot other ones, but, but I'm going to stop there. And... Thank you so much. Um, you know, it's such a unique opportunity to have a conversation with uh, the, the four of you and the, the expertise that you bring. I, I want to ask uh, some questions. I know we won't have time to get through all of them, but I want to start with one that's very much on my mind. When we think about scholarship around health equity, we spent a lot of time documenting the existence of inequities and disparities. And then when it came to how to address them, there wasn't quite as much there. So how do we avoid the same phenomenon here? So we now have this growing, it's, it's already was rich, but a growing body of evidence showing the relationship between racism and poor health outcomes and health disparities. But just knowing doesn't mean they'll change. How does research and scholarship contribute not just to understanding the link between these concepts, but helping develop the pathway for uh, eliminating the, the, this core cause of inequity? Who wants to? Take a start on that one. Dr. Wheel, I just want to say that our article tried to make this point, uh, again, acknowledging my co-author, Dr. Williams, that we have evidence going back to the 1800s, including Du Bois, who talked about segregation and the impact of segregation. We have maternal and child health and Black infant mortality and Puerto Rican infant mortality has been a well-researched issue way back through the 70s and 80s. And I think immediately of two really important books. One was by Angela Davis on slavery. And she started, I think, us thinking about epigenetics, which was essentially the treatment that women received that was so stressful that it impacted their genetic systems. We also have Leith Mullings who did a study. So the question, so David and I, we, we were trying to make the point, all this has been done, we know about stress. Stress is an old factor. I've been teaching stress for 30 years. As an, I had no real evidence except some common sense and some studies that stress particularly the stress of poverty and the lack of ability to resolve issues has a very adverse effect on your body. So I think the, where we end in our paper is we know all this. How do we make the political and social investments to start the change? I think Dr. Braverman spoke about the multiple ways that social determinants and socioeconomic determinants drive inequities. One good example is we know that the school system is based on real estate property taxes. We also know that residential segregation decreases values. So what about proposing, what about we don't need the research, we need the investments and then do the research. Because what is happening if we continue to do the research under the same conditions, we're gonna get the same effects. And I think that's what you're referring to. So we keep repeating ourselves and reproducing. Where do we stop and really make the investments? And I do think there are different perspectives. Um, Dr. Figueroa, I think that Tom Shapiro's book on toxic inequality shows that clearly policies were intentionally and strategically developed to disadvantage African-Americans and Mexican-Americans and Puerto Ricans in this country. That it was not colorblind, it was intentional and strategic. So 
how do we all sort of come on the same page and agree that we cannot continue to do research to reproduce the same findings? How do we change them? And what is our role in this change? I mean, one role I think Dr. Hadaman alluded to is we need to have a workforce. We need to have an, a set of investigators, clinicians, practitioners who really understand the issue so that they can come together to engage in work and engage in interventions that will begin to produce the outcomes that we're seeing. So well, I'd like to, yes, go ahead, Dr. Braden. I was gonna say, I mean, I'm an optimist because I couldn't go on if I, if I weren't. <laughs> um, and um, my hope is the fact that we have sort of simultaneously the accumulation of these bodies of evidence. Um, and at the same time, we, uh, and, and, and understanding of, of pathways, pathways to, um, um, to health from, from racism, that, um, that the mere fact that there is focus right now on systemic and structural racism and that there's an awareness that laws and policies created racism and lo only laws and policies can get rid of it. Um, and so my, my, my hope is that the, that realization is going to carry us forward and that we know, you know, we know a lot of, there are a lot of things that we can do. I mean, there's in, inadequate enforcement of existing laws and then we need to pass uh, more equitable laws, including laws that would prevent voter suppression. You know, uh, do we need a truth and re reconciliation process in this country? Um, and um, uh, just that we're, you know, are we ready to, is there an understanding that regardless of the intent, the structures, that have the effect of disadvantaging um, populations of color must be, that they must be dismantled. Dr. Hardiman. So um, I completely agree with what both uh, Dr. Zambrana and Dr. Braveman just, um, just shared. And I wanted to reiterate a point I think that Dr. Braveman um, alluded to, which is, you know, we do have certainly have an undeniable evidence, right, that structural racism and other forms of racism are impacting health and well-being. And we see that perpetuated every day in, um, in our policy at all levels, right? At, you know, whether it's at the city level, where here in Minneapolis, I sit where I currently live, um, we're watching a discussion play out around no knock warrants, policy, city level policy that um, killed yet another black man in our community, right? And so I think when, when we talk about sort of the premise of, in our paper of measuring structural racism and the fact that we don't value and we can't change what we don't measure, we have to be thinking about leveraging the data that has created those policies to begin with. So leveraging government, you know, government data, census data to really think about and ask the question is and how is op uh, racism operating here and how do we measure that and capture that in a way that informs new policy and anti-racist policy. So I, I, I want to go in two different directions with where the conversation has gone thus far. I want to make a comment and then, but try not to go down a rabbit hole. It's, a, it's always a risk in these things, which is if structural racism is the, the iceberg below the water and its origins are racism, racist views, Dr. Zambrano said these were not unintentional, this was intentional. And then you need to change laws and we talk about programs and policies, but if it was racist views that led to the policies that create the structural racism, how do you change the laws without eliminating the racist views? I mean, it, I, I understand that the structure is what underpins and is uh, the, the more visible manifestations, Dr. Braveman, that, that you mentioned is above the iceberg. But can we really, I mean, I, I don't want this to turn into a political science seminar, but can we really 
expect to change the laws that created the inequities if the racism that created those laws in people, the, 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 the concepts of racism that created those laws are still held by so many people. But rather than ask you to answer that question directly, because it's more one that I hope will sort of frame the day, I want to ask it in a, a again, to try to keep us out of the rabbit hole, I wanna ask a slight variant on it, which is, and particularly I'm noting our two theme advisors did have the curse and the benefit of reading hundreds and hundreds of abstracts. But as we think about what contribution health services research can make to the enterprise of reversing the effects of racism in health, what is it, uh, Rather than talking about the need to build a political movement, I'd like to talk about what's the evidence base that doesn't exist? What's the knowledge that we don't yet have where knowledge could actually be a force and a power for the kind of, of, of uh, commitment? And I'll just, one last thought here, which is we have health systems and sectors outside of healthcare all over embracing the goal of equity. So, what is it that could be said to them that says, if you're serious about equity, you have to be serious about dismantling racism. And here is what you need to know in order to give that meaning. So these are big questions, but you're my big thinkers. So uh, who can help me out here? I'd start with preschool. <laughs> I, I, I think that, that early education and um, uh, the development of, I think there already are some beautiful materials that are, um, that are there that, you know, that need to be distributed more widely that can be used for an anti-racist um, education. What, you know, what you're, uh, what people are up against in putting those curricula into effect of course there's been a lot of a lot of resistance against that I, I guess again my optimism that over time um you know that over time we are going to see some change and and that we i mean simultaneously with the the dismantling of the structures we we also need to be dealing with the with the attitudes, and and I draw some hope from uh, uh, from uh, the media, actually, and just I mean compared with thirty years ago, you know the presence of people of color in impressive attractive, you know, positions um, in media, you know, has really changed. And I think that that has a change, that has an effect that's, um, that's subliminal, um, probably, but maybe one of the most powerful. So that we just, we need, we need to go at it at, um, from, from multiple angles and health services research per se may not be, uh, may not be what, you know, one of the major battlefronts. Well, you've just ruined my day, but I, uh, <laughs> but I know you're right. Uh, who else wants to weigh in on this one, topic? One uh, thing I'll, oh, sorry. Yes. Go ahead. Oh, the one thing I'll ask in terms of the answer of health services researchers, one role is, is we, we have the ability to provide evidence, uh, data, and, and the better the data, the better we hope that the policymakers can make those decisions. And one thing to note, and you, I know you didn't want to get into the political process, but the, it is important to know that sometimes the views of the people are not necessarily reflected in local and state government. One clear example, if we go back to the Medicaid expansion, one of your funders, Episcopal Health, funded this survey in Texas where 70% of the population supported Medicaid expansion, including a lot of Republicans. But even if 70% of an entire state supports Medicaid expansion, it is not passing and it's arguably nowhere near passing anytime in the near future. And that's why we're looking to federal policies like maybe in the Build Back Better Act to solve that gap. 
But, and the reality is that unfortunately people of color are not often engaged in the political process. We don't vote, we don't hold office at local and state levels. It's really important. A lot of the policies are set locally. And if we don't have better engagement of people of color in the political process, it's gonna be really challenging to change. Even if we wait, you know, I think, you know, Rachel had that beautiful, you know, James Baldwin quote to start her, 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 her paper. It's like, you know, how long do we wait? It's been a long time and things have yet to change. And, and it's active engagement is one of them. And, and our job is to, to help give better data to help that process. And I would just add, you know, so Alan, you said, you know, we're, we're your big thinker, so I'm going to think big <laughs> in my response. But I think when I think about the evidence base that doesn't quite exist yet, um, we have to ask the question of are, are we willing to give up power and who's willing to give up that power, right? And, and also mm -hmm. along with that, um, provide the material resources needed to affect change to the folks who need them, right? So we have come a long ways in finally naming racism and now measuring racism and having these special issues and these discussions, which is great. But I think what we have to do next is understand how closely power is tied to structural and systemic racism, and then really reflect as a field on sort of who's in power, who has the power, who's willing to give that up um, in order to um, really see these the changes that we're, we're talking about. You know, I, I think a lot about, um, you know, a quote that Dr. Monica McLemore um, has said many times, um, and I won't, I'm paraphrasing, paraphrasing, but, you know, it's simply that we can't continue to um, retrofit or sort of try to fit equity and anti-racist work into the current um, structures and systems. Instead, we have to really be thinking about, um, you know, that power question. And then how do we build systems that are, that lead with anti-racism and lead with equity? I'd like Dr. to Dr. add, um, <laughs> yes. This might, um, I, Make, make your day, uh, Alan, but I would also add that I think that doing what um, health affairs has made a very deliberate uh, point of doing, you know, over the last, over the last year, um, uh, uh, diversifying, <laughs> uh, diversifying who's involved in, in leadership and um, and diversifying uh, the the author authorship also, I I think that that's a very important contribution, and and I'd also like to fit, fit in something that I should have said right at the beginning, which was just that the that the paper, <clears throat> excuse me, the paper that um, that I contributed for this special issue uh, uh, was um, uh, drew it, its basis largely from a, a much more extensive um, document produced by the um, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that is about to come out uh, any day now and an and issue brief on, on systemic racism. Great, thank you. Acknowledge that. Yes, Dr. Zambrano, yes, you were. Yeah, I just wanna go, the, your question was, what knowledge do we not have to make a difference and what can health researchers do? I think we do have a major, uh, another battleground in science between what is science for? Is science for knowledge or is science to solve social problems? Now, health services researchers, which I am a health services research, and I worked at the Agency for Healthcare Policy and Research when they really in the 80s were doing a lot around bringing to the fore what was important in terms of health outcomes. And they were doing some really good work. So I, I think health services researchers, we need to lay our claim that we believe that health services research is to solve social problems. I think we need to address the language, which Dr. Williams and I address in our paper. The language is stark, it creates tensions. The issue of equity challenges everything that America stands for. I mean, it challenges a nation of democracy. It challenges a nation of equality. 
I mean, we are not equal because some people have so much less, so we don't get to the gate with the same resources. Um, it challenges individual centered success. It challenges meritocracy. So what has happened, unfortunately, is that equity means different things to, to different people. So equity can be a dismantling voice if health services researchers commit to our work as a way to solve social problems. I think we also must incorporate history. I mean, we have a society that thinks that the present is it. We are the most progressive, most innovative, and we don't have to worry about history. History must be part of our synthesis of our understanding. And the other thing I wanna say is that intersectionality, we have to stop using black, for example, as an independent variable. It is a descriptor. We have to look at African-Americans, at Mexican-Americans. We cannot throw all Latinos into an equation and say, hey, they're doing great. So in a paradigm that is interdisciplinary, intersectional, and that really understands, I think, what has been said on what structural racism is. So when we do a study, we need to understand the community context. I just cannot support the idea that we need more research. I think that we have a lot of research. We need to pull it together and look at what we know in our studies and say, let's intervene here. Dr. Braverman says preschool. Yes, let's have a school system where everyone gets an equal amount. So we have to start someplace. But I think health services researchers can do a lot equally important and I think Dr. Hadaman talked, we need to bring into these scientific spaces, the voices of those who have lived those experiences, those who really care about those experiences, those who can add context because they have been there. So I think training and development of that workforce is really important. And I think the continued inclusion of articles of this nature in health affairs and other major journals is critically important so that the public becomes aware that we are all in this together. And that's what we need to move forward. We're all in this together. Well, uh, you've made the transition for me to our next panel, but before I close us out, I wanna say, even though you said we don't need more research, I think <laughs> what you're really, what I think you're saying is we don't need to wait for more research and yes, that I think you. is clear but there are areas where our knowledge base is not as deep as it could be and Dr. Hardiman your comment made me think you know you asked about who's willing to give up power I'm going to turn this a little bit more into a research question which is where are there examples of places where power has been shared where power structures have been dismantled and what are the implications and it could be both helpful to understand how those shifts can address the inequities that people say they want to dismantle, but it could also do a lot, and this is a hypothesis, it could do a lot to reduce the anxiety of those in positions of privilege to feel that anything they let go of will lead to a crumbling of their entire universe mm -hmm. and the, the, uh, the, the, the lack of, of health and security that they have uh, grown accustomed to. Because my hypothesis, and I, I say this very clearly, my hypothesis is that uh, the people who are holding on to power aren't in as uh, tenuous a position as they uh, think they are. And so I do think if as we start to we act to, under, uh, to, to, to hit some of these parts of the iceberg, uh, we ought to look at the effects. And, and we at Health Affairs will be happy to publish uh, studies on that topic. So to my uh, panelists, thank you for uh, this conversation, for your contributions to the theme issue, the overviews for those of you in the audience. I hope you will read the full papers. You'll get uh, much more depth there, um, but it's uh, great to have been able to kick off the conversation with the four of you. And now um, I'm going to turn us and uh, to our second panel, which as I just uh, noted is, uh, uh, exactly the conversation that uh, Dr. Zambrana said we need to have, which is to bring in uh, more of the experience 
of those who can speak to uh, what, it, uh, what these concepts mean in, in their lives and in the real world. Uh, I'm so pleased to be able to turn to Richard Tate to moderate this uh, panel. Richard is the Executive Vice President of the California Wellness Foundation. And um, I think without further ado, Richard, I'll hand Thank you, Dr. the Wheel. microphone over to you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Alan, and hello, everyone. I have to say it's a thrill for me to be part of this conversation today. I remember quite well in December of 2016, sitting in conversation with Alan uh, as we celebrated the publication of a different theme issue uh, and talking about just the rise in um, racial animus in our country after the 2016 election, concerns about how we were and were not talking about race, and the idea that one day we might be talking with the health affairs audience about the intersection of racism and health. And here we are. Mm -hmm. So it's an exciting moment and this conversation is as timely as ever. Over the last two pandemic years, we've also endured uh, a series of racial reckon reckonings that continue in this country. Uh, and this is the time for us to be confronting issues of racism and health in all of the spaces where it impacts our daily lives. I'm fortunate enough, as Alan mentioned, to be in leadership at a foundation, the California Wellness Foundation, that works squarely at the intersection of health, racial equity, and social justice. And so this conversation is not a new one in our organization, but we know that there are many spaces where talking explicitly around race is challenging. And I am so thrilled that I have four one wonderful panelists today who are willing to talk about their own experience and the experience of their communities in the way that they think about research and healthcare service research and their own personal experiences um, in terms of racism and health. Um, this is a really exciting time for us to be talking about this. Um, uh, we're going to do something a little bit different in this panel. Uh, we're not going to be talking, uh, these researchers won't be talking specifically about their papers or diving deeply into the data, but they will give you a sense of what it was like for them to participate in this theme issue around racism and health. They will certainly touch upon the research, which you can read in the health affairs issue. Um, but they'll also be sharing a little bit of their own lived experiences and the lived experiences of the communities um, that they've studied uh, and why it's important for us to really embrace community experience uh, as we talk about racism and healthcare. There's one thing that I want to quote from a piece, an essay that Alan wrote in the introduction to this theme issue that I think is really important. Alan wrote, most, most health services scholarship, whether discussing payment policies or coverage initiatives, remains highly abstract. The power and purported precision of quantitative methods overshadows the uncertainty, complexity, and messiness of the real world. And I think that that is what this conversation is about today. I myself, as a biracial gay man, have experienced how my identity um, impacts my access to healthcare, my experience with the healthcare system. And I think it's important for all of us as we think about the research and the quantitative methods in which we understand what's driving uh, disparities in healthcare to really um, be willing to talk about our own personal experiences and how that informs our thinking. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn to our panelists. Um, you uh, see their names and their affiliations. We're gonna do something slightly different in introductions. I'm gonna move through some questions. I'm hoping this will be a conversation, but I'm gonna ask each panelist to briefly introduce themselves, um, uh, how, uh, how they're affiliated, uh, their affiliation, um, how they identify, uh, what communities they identify with uh, as we get started in the conversation today. I want to start with a question. Um, all of the papers, all of the writing, the contributions that each researcher has made um, has touched on issues of erasure in research. And whether that's in data or lack of voice or elsewhere. Um, and in our prep conversation, there was an idea that came up among this group of, of, um, of researchers um, that poor data quality is a form of structural racism. And that was really compelling to me um, as we sort of drive into uh, some of the challenges that we're facing in healthcare services research and delivery. And so I wanna actually um, start with uh, Stella Yee um, and invite Stella to kick us off. And Stella, can you just tell us a little bit more about this idea of 
poor data quality as a form of structural racism and how you see that really undergirding some of the issues that we're facing in public health. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Stella Yi. I'm an associate professor at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine in the section for health equity. Um, I identify as a Korean American woman, epidemiologist and mother of three very spirited children. So I identify with mothers are my community. So um, thanks, that's a great question, Richard. So uh, from my perspective, poor data quality is really the underpinning of public health infrastructure. And think about all the information on communities, how communities have been faring during the pandemic. This has been foundational to every single action step that follows as a part of the public health response. So um, particularly when it comes to fairness and allocation of resources. Um, the rich narrative that we have based on the data that we have on racial ethnic minority groups that has unfolded throughout the pandemic, this data allows us to talk about social determinants of health. It allows us to talk about who is getting vaccinated and where and why. And then importantly, what we can do to try to change the narrative. So data that does not appropriately represent the US population is unjust and it's unfair. And when people don't see themselves reflected in data, in stories, in media, how can we expect people to trust our healthcare system or government enough to share that information about themselves and to get vaccinated and to follow guidance? There was a, thank you, Stella. There was another um, idea that came up um, about objectivity and data. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that as well, Stella. Yes, thanks, Richard. So people really like to believe that, that data is objective, but this is absolutely not true. Data 100% goes through a filter of the person who is collecting analyzing, reporting, or digesting that data. So the personal belief system of that person drives data interpretation. So, oh, we see disparities in groups where we expect to see them. And we do not see disparities in groups where we do, do not expect to see them and that we believe to be better off. So case closed, report written, manuscript published. But in our paper, we really urge people to try to examine their implicit and explicit biases about the Asian American community. So think about what you believe about this community and why, where did those beliefs come from? And ask yourself if it then changes the way that you are interpreting data, results, or report, or media findings. And we really hope that this article gives people um, some foundation to approach data on Asian Americans and other small communities with skepticism. This is what we do as scholars every day in this research space. And I really think that it's only by making these small reflective incremental changes in our practices that we can actually start to make progress in the health equity conversation. Mm -hmm. And it underscores Alan's point in the essay that I mentioned around the purported precision of quantitative methods of research. And I know each of you has done some research that moves beyond purely the quantitative um, to really embrace um, who gets to interpret and tell the story uh, and who gets to be represented in the data. So we'll touch on that in a little bit. I want to take a moment, though, um, and Melanie, I'm going to come to you because uh, as Estella articulated, you know, the data that we collect and the erasure within that data is part of the, the problem in the public health infrastructure that we're just beginning to address. Um, but how did we get here? There's something about historical narratives and context that feels really important. And I think you, you've done a really um, incredible job of sort of articulating why that context and historical narrative is important. So please share a little bit with us about um, your work. Thank you so much, Richard, and um, it's been an honor to be on this panel with these powerful women um, of color, especially um, with this special issue. So thank you so much. So I'm Melanie Sabato Liwag, um, identify as a Filipina American first generation um, and also um, a Los Angelino born and raised. And so I just want to be able to express that more so about my background because it is in, intertwined with identity and the experiences in which I see the world and how I've seen um, my, my ancestors and those who come before me um, experience the types of um, health outcomes that they are experiencing today or have experienced. Um, and so your question is a really great one and it piggybacks off of 
exactly what Stella had mentioned in regards to data disaggregation, um, being an important uh, variable with um, understanding what are health indicators and what is traditionally measured um, at a federal, state, or even a local level. And oftentimes the power is left in the community um, and the voices that are usually unsung or overlooked more so because um, it is not a my majority uh, expression. And so um, with the paper that we have uh, produced here, um, a number of us are interdisciplinary co-authors um, spanning across public health, health sector. Um, and we just really wanted to express how we got here in terms of health determinants and health inequities that the Filipino American community has been experiencing um, over the past century. Um, more so because we often are clumped with um, all our wonderful Asian Americans. Um, however, because we are the third largest Asian American and fastest growing community in the United States, um, our narrative is often left unseen, more so because it is very unique and our experiences are unique considering that the US had actually um, colonized the Philippines back in 1898 um, after a, a 300 year span of um, colonization under the Spanish rule as well. Um, but one of these things to mention is how these things are interpreted. Um, most likely people are seen under the model minority myth of Asian Americans seen as more well off than other people. Um, and so that's also seen under um, you know, Filipino American experiences more so with the colonial mentality of accepting this American westernized dominance. Um, and so these indicators that often are more equated to a healthier well-being, healthier outcomes, such as high education, high income, um, English proficiency, we check mark all those boxes, but we are not conferring the normal um, pathways of, of experiencing health, ac uh, health access and health utilization and health outcomes that are positively related to those types of um, health indicators that are traditionally um, um, accepted, but we are pushing the boundaries and saying, we need to do more than that. Thank you, Melanie. I, I, wanna, I wanna bring Terri Ann into the conversation um, in part because you know, we talked a little bit about um, voice uh, and, and, and uh, thinking differently about research methodologies. And I know that your work really um, took a different approach. I'd love to have you talk a little bit about um, research, voice, and how that's informed how you, you're thinking about racism and health and how we understand that more explicitly. Sure. Thank you so much, Richard, and good afternoon, all. My name is Carrie Ann Thompson, and I am a senior research scientist at Ibis Reproductive Health, and I identify as an Afro-Caribbean American woman. Um, it's truly been an honor, um, as Richard mentioned, to work on uh, our research study, which is the Trust Black Woman Study, and it represents collaborative work that was done by Black women for Black women. As such, there's a sense of shared commitment to making sure that the work actually authentically and respectfully represented the experiences of Black women living in two Southern states, Georgia and North Carolina. Our research board, which was all Black leaders within the communities, ensured our study was not siloed in its approach to understand the reproductive health experiences and concerns, while the community organizations that we worked with actually helped to collect the data and made sure that the participants felt safe and unrushed in sharing their stories. Something that's a, it's nuanced, but it's very different in terms of the research approach. So we really feel that incorporating all of those voices, those ideas of various stakeholders into the design, into the collection and the interpretation of the data actually helped to enhance the validity as well as the utility of the findings. And this is something that we see you know, in the literature where community-based participatory research approaches are concerned, these are approaches that we've seen bring about better health outcomes, more sustainable interventions, uh, you know, more effective dissemination and translation of findings, as well as um, it, some, it, it's actually one of the methods that we've seen has had some success in actually reducing by providing more targeted solutions, some of the disparities that we see in, in various communities in the US. So this voice, both in the production of the research as well as in the actual data that's coming out is, is important. 
Tarian, can you give us a, a, a story or a concrete example of how of how that experience of voice in this research has shifted your thinking, any ahas or uh, just to make it real for people, why, why this approach is important? Sure, so I will say one of the things that, um, you know, I, I was thinking today as I was preparing for this um, symposium of the very first meeting we had with our research board. And I remember at the time we had come up with this idea of doing this work and in, in getting these experiences. Um, and I came off the airplane, we had landed in, in Atlanta and overheard a woman of color, a black woman actually talking about her research, recent maternal health experience or recent delivery experience. And she said quite clearly on the phone, I will never have a hospital delivery again because it was so horrific, it was so traumatic. And so we went into this research board meeting and I said you know, to our research board, this is the, the issue of the now, we need to hear, we need to see what the experience of, of women living in the South is, you know, as, it, as it pertains to the reproductive health lifespan. And sure enough, Richard, those stories were rife in the listening sessions that we saw. It was not just about how horrible, uh, to use their words, the delivery experience was, but it was about the strategies that many women actually used to arm those in their social networks, to arm those in their, in their family networks with either how to navigate the hospital system or quite frankly, to avoid the hospital system entirely. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that gives you a little bit of a flavor, but it takes the present day moving into the, the actual like research board and thinking about what questions do we ask to seeing it actually come up unprompted in the very listening sessions with women in North Carolina and Georgia. And what's, what's, for, what's more, I should say, Richard, is that we have seen as we've presented these results that these stories have resonated, not just with our group, but resonated in every space that we've brought these results with Black women, with women uh, who identify as Latino or, or Latinx, We've seen it resonate across across racial lines as well as across geographic lines. Thank you. It's a great example. It just is a it's a reinforces the, this idea that numbers alone don't tell the story. And when you start listening to people and understanding their experiences, as you just said, it's not necessarily just one story you're hearing. It's a kernel of something that is persisted across groups and, and really thinking about different approaches and ways to get at those deeper issues is, is part of uh, what this work represents. So that's terrific. Um, so Agnes, I wanna bring you into the conversation. Terry Ann's talked a little bit about the stories that people are telling now about their experience. Melanie, you did a beautiful job of talking about the importance of historical context and narrative that develops over time about different communities and populations. And Agnes, you've talked about um, something that I think is incredibly um, painful about race and racism, which is that it is not something that impacts one person at one moment in time. There are uh, long histories and generational impacts of racism that we're dealing with. Um, so my experience today is the aggregation of generations of experience. And so I want you to talk a little bit about what you learned in your work and um, some of your takeaways around the intergenerational impacts of racism. Thank you very much, Richard, and thank you to the panel. Um, awesome group of folks, scholars here who are discussing a very important issue. So I'm Agnes Attica, and I'm affiliated, affiliated with the University of Arizona with the Center for Rural Health and also the American Indian Research Center for Health. I am Dine Navajo. I am indigenous to the state of Arizona, but I am also impacted by the policies of um, boarding schools and urban relocation. So I grew up in the suburbs of California as well. So in our paper, um, our in paper is interesting in that we started off with stories. So our authors come from a community of scholars, from faculty and staff at the University of Arizona, from students, from community members, advocates, and tra traditional healers. So we came together and talked about what is structural racism. And we started off with stories, personal stories of how we were impacted by policies uh, that were placed on American Indians that really created inequities and have created uh, cascading health disparities that have impacted our current people. So well, for instance, uh, I would like to talk a little bit about myself. So in the article, the first story is about me. 
and about COVID-19 and how I've lost eight members during that time, but now it actually has expanded to 12 as of now of people who've been impacted by COVID-19. And how did that really start? It was because of the structural um, inequities that were created by policies, US federal policies that created reservations were basically concentration camps to force people to live on the land that may have been foreign to them. So there was no access to foods. There was really very limited access to health care, and there was very limited access to education and opportunities for employment. So you've created a situation where people mm -hmm. needed to access uh, health care where there was really not much health care. And really, these stories are important because when we come and approach an issue in our tribal communities, we come together as a group to discuss what the problem is. So we identify the problem and we discuss and see what how it's impacting our communities. And then we come up with solutions that would help our community come up uh, with ways to, to overcome these health disparities. Now, the way that these racist policies have impacted our communities are um, that, um, that, um, Sorry, there was some noise in the background there. So, um, so they've really impacted our communities in that, for instance, for my story, when um, I grew up, I grew up on the Navajo reservation and my parents were sent to boarding school. So they were forced, they were, they were forced to go to a boarding school in Riverside, California and provide opportunities to become vocational workers. So they became machine operators and worked in factories in the state of California. And we lived in, in California suburbs for a very long time and we didn't have access to healthcare because we did not, uh, insurance was not something we had. So whenever we need healthcare, we went back to the Navajo reservation and accessed the Indian health service there. So it was very limited time that we had, you know, looked at dental care and eye care and for medical care. So we didn't have that much care growing up. And my father, he was a Korean War veteran. So he fought in the Korean War and he, and he saw horrible things there. And so he was impacted psychologically and he walked with the ghosts of people that he'd seen killed. And so he didn't really, was not able to access veterans care because the closest veterans care for him on the Navajo reservation was in Prescott, Arizona off the reservation, which is many times a three to four hour drive, depending on where you go. So he didn't really receive any care. And so he developed a, an alcohol problem. So he saw, fought alcohol for most of his life until his death. And so that really impacted the rest of us because, you know, we saw drinking, you know, we saw him struggle psychologically with his demons and, you know, it impacted his work environment and impacted his relationship with my mother. And we saw that happen. And so out of all the siblings that we have, we, all of us have really been impacted by alcohol. We've impacted up by substance abuse you know, of various kinds of domestic violence. And so we are looking at our children and saying, we don't want that to happen. And so we are learning from those stories of uh, what have impacted our families. And so we don't want that for our children. So that's just an example of what has happened to me. But I think there's other stories here as well on this panel be very similar of policies that have impacted us and has created these health disparities and how we all are here changing that through our research, through our work in the communities, through our advocacy and becoming role models for our future. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Agnes. Um, yeah, it's a great example of uh, your story of uh, you know why in a moment where let's take the pandemic, we're asking people to take a vaccine and we're experiencing reluctance. There's a whole history of experience. Our parents, you know, our uncles and aunties who've had experiences that have been passed down to us and other issues, frankly, health issues that we're wrestling with um, that don't really come to light in that moment when we're asking people to take action in a public health context that need to be better understood. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit. I'm going to open this up uh, to any of our panelists who want to respond. One of the most powerful uh, parts of my connection with this uh, group of terrific scholars was to hear each of you talk about the experience of producing this work for this theme issue, to, to actually be invited to write about racism and health. 
And I would venture that each of you as people of color, race was not a new concept or issue for you uh, as you came into doing this work. And each of you shared a little bit about the personal experience you had in being invited in this scholarly context to write about this topic or issue. Can each of you just take a minute and tell us what it's meant to you um, to be invited to talk explicitly about racism and health? Um, and what, if anything, um, has uh, emerged for you uh, as, a, as a result of doing this work, um, good or, or challenging? Um, Richard, I'm happy to start. Um, so thank you for making this space for us to share this. Um, I, I did share on our, on our panel prep call that like I talk, we talk a lot about lived experience and, and, and I myself as a researcher who focuses on Asian American health, I, I focus a lot on the lived experiences of the people of the communities that we're working with, but I focus less on my own lived experience. And this paper really tapped into that lived experience. And, you know, Agnes's story about her family and your story about your parents, it really reminded me that like, this has been incredibly, it, it's a paper about data. It's a paper about racialized stereotypes, but it has been incredibly personally traumatic for me to write this paper because it taps into like, you know, my parents came here as immigrants from Korea. They worked, they worked really hard to make it here. And then me, like their generation, my ch their grandchildren, they're, we're all invisible in this data system. We're all invisible in this COVID response. Like how many times do you hear Asian Americans being talked about in this whole conversation? So. That is really what drew to the surface for me. And this was like this interplay, like I'm, I live in New York City. I'm afraid to go down the street. I, don't, I still don't take the subway. I'm afraid to be spit on and walk down the street with my children. Like this is the lived experience that yes, this paper for health affairs really brought out for me. And I really appreciate the space that was given to, to share this experience. And thank you for giving us the space on the panel to talk about that today. Mm. Thank you, Stella, for, for sharing that. Like, it, it, I, it, it saddens me, but it makes sense to me that when you're invited to tap into something that's deeper and personal, um, it's a real challenge, but I think it's of service to the greater good and to, and to all of the folks who are listening today and, and will be interacting with the issue. Um, I, I wanna invite others, uh, other of our panelists to, to just reflect a little bit on the experience of, of contributing. Melanie? Alan, I could, oh, I was going to oh, say, no, no, go ahead, ahead, Terry. totally, <laughs> Terry, I can go first and then That's I can right. follow up. Go ahead for it. Sure thing. It's hard to see who is gearing up to go next. <laughs> um, so, you know, again, thank. Uh, I'll echo what Stella said and say thank you for giving us the opportunity to really reflect on what it means to do this work. I think for me, there are two parts here. So the first is what it meant to, to be part of a larger movement, which is the bigger Trust Black Women study, which actually really allowed us to give voice to some of the, I think the concepts that quite frankly don't get challenged in our society. So concepts like resilience, right? Being an actual harmful term for Black women in this country. It is, it is actually problematic to be strong in some ways and actually goes against you know, things like engaging with mental health, as an example, or even feeling like you can't get or shouldn't ask for support for many of the issues that we face. So I, I think, you know, it really was powerful for me to, to be in a space where I could actually hear things that resonated for me, like resilience being a, a, a troubling, a problematic term for a population, or to hear a, more about concepts that get almost no time um, or no ear time in terms of the black population, like the struggles around dealing with cases of infertility in the black community, whether that's internal or external. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about con controlling our fertility, but not so much around family formation within the, within the black population. And even concepts like adoption, which came up in our listening session, just doesn't get as much ear time. So that was a pretty powerful experience for me. But I will say specifically for this Health Affairs article, what was really cathartic, where there was healing, was actually to show what our title says, quite frankly, which is racism runs through it. Racism was unprompted as a feature of the reproductive health experience of Black women living in the South. And I, I imagine is a, is a common feature and an unprompted feature of many Black women's reproductive health experiences here in the U.S. And so to be able to sit with that data and to show 
how racism creates these inequities that we see in access, in experience, and in utilization was absolutely powerful. And something as small as being able to, I hope, I hope it will be powerful to policymakers, but something as small as being able to say, it is, it is unconscionable that Black women have to engage with the healthcare system multiple times for one medical condition. Mm. Should prompt you to do something about that. Should mm. prompt you to, to create a healthcare system that operates in a way that better serves uh, this population's health and gives them a better sense of, of you know, healthcare experience. So that's what it meant for me. And I will pause there and um, let Melanie Thank speak. You. No, thank you so much. I will leave time for you, Agnes, I promise. Um, I think I, I don't speak on just behalf of myself, but I speak on behalf of the other 10 authors that uh, gave their heart and soul into this project as well. More so like Stella and Terri-Ann, and I'm sure Agnes will resonate, is that we had to unpack all this stuff, not only for our families and those in the diaspora of the communities of which we identify, but, the, but for ourselves and our profession. More so because as a Philippine American, majority of us do work in health and healthcare. And I think one of the biggest things that the invisibility part for uh, Filipino Americans and this paper being published in a high impact journal has a lot to do with our visibility and the fact that we have a, a seat at this table is exciting and empowering and it just drives us to do and want to do more for the community um, in hope that stakeholders, policymakers, everyone up the chain can ride on this momentum, more so only because, again, it, it shouldn't just ebb and flow because of the pandemic. Um, it's existed before the pandemic and it will exist after the pandemic. Um, and all these um, intergenerational traumas that we do experience, whether it's for myself, my family, and for you know, those who come after me, like my son, I wanna leave and we wanna leave a legacy that says we did something to stand up against the system, against a white supremacy and white dominance. Um, and how do we do that? We have to do that with empowering the voices um, and being able to have a seat at the platform to make these policy changes real. So thank you so much again for this opportunity. So I'm gonna bounce to uh, Agnes. Thank you very much, Melanie. And uh, my last words uh, are that, you know, this provides context to a lot of data that was talked about earlier. You know, the story is there's people behind the data and we need to share those stories of how policies have impacted us, but also ways that we can improve and um, provide examples of resilience. And so in our paper, we talk about our cultural wisdom document, which is a model for policy change. And we focus on indigenous principles on traditional healers and the importance of funding to be able to provide culturally relevant services to our community. So a lot of the programs that have been developed based on the data were uh, many times westernized um, programs with Western values. And many times those program and interventions did not work because people it was not relevant to people. And so you really need to look at developing programs that are culturally relevant, that are resonate with people, that are created by our people, that are run by our people, and hopefully in the future funded by our people so we know who the, where the monies would go to. So I think that is really important is that we do provide context. We have uh, stories of resilience. We have a ways that we can overcome these and you know we are here and we'll keep thriving and we are role models for our next generation of scholars. Hmm. Well, I, to wrap us up, I just wanna express my admiration and my appreciation for each of the terrific scholars that we've heard from today for not only applying your professional expertise but your personal experience, both you and your co-authors to this theme issue. And I wanna appreciate Alan and his team for creating space for this kind of scholarship and this frank dialogue about racism and health. Um, more of this, I think, is what we need. We've just scratched the surface. Um, I encourage every policymaker, health funder, decision maker who's listening to pick up the issue, read it, and think about how you can be part of making positive change to address the issues that, that we're talking about today. And Alan, with that, I will turn it back to you. Richard, thank you so much for leading that amazing discussion. Your uh, kind reference back to our conversation so many years ago uh, that really is the birth of this issue. Um, but also for your 
uh, uh, there's no other word for it, masterful way of weaving together the personal and the broader empirical. Um, the, the people who do this work bring all of themselves to it, and uh, it, it's what makes it strong. And, and you were able, in a, in a really wonderful way, to, to make sure that those in the audience could, could understand not just the content, but the context. So thank you for that. My honor. Um, all good uh, long meetings need a break, and uh, we're going to go to one. Uh, but as I take you to a 10-minute break, for those of you who can live with seven minutes, I'm going to encourage you to stay online for just a, a couple of minutes. Um, I mentioned at the outset that we have uh, this morning released a half-hour video interview of Harriet Washington. We're going to show you just a couple of minute trailer. It'll give you some of the highlights. After the trailer ends, you'll have some silence uh, for a, a, about seven more minutes, and we will return for our third panel after a 10 minute break. The impact of racism has been damaging and long-lasting to the U.S. society. For more than 400 years, racism has influenced practices and policies that have led to unfair disadvantages for some racial and ethnic communities, while in turn providing advantages and sustained powers to others. Scientific racism. Um, have these beliefs ever truly been reconciled or have they been undone by the healthcare system to date? No. We've had a long history of these mythologies being presented as science. They're not science. As Dorothy Roberts pointed out so brilliantly, racism created race, not the yes. other way around. Right. The Tuskegee syphilis study, it's like the well-known that everyone kind of go to, even during this time of COVID, right? But this was not an anomaly. And what are the other key moments in history that you would highlight from medical apartheid? There are so many studies that far exceeded Tuskegee in their venality, and in their harms, in their mortality. Tuskegee is fr frankly, as bad as it is, just a shadow. So how has the conversation on racism and health changed from the time that you wrote The Medical Apartheid till now? It has changed dramatically. When I wrote Medical Apartheid, even writing about racial issues in health was difficult. Frankly, systemic racism was not even in, forget the vocabulary, the mindset of many people at that point. We're not talking about a few bad apples, so to speak. We're talking about a system that's profoundly flawed, has been from the beginning, and needs uh, amendation. Can you speak uh, more about the historical issues regarding consent? African Americans were not, it wasn't their health that was prized. It was their bodies and the work that could be extracted from them. We're in dire straits today in terms of informed consent. We're really in danger of losing it. And we need to be very vigilant on behalf of people who can't fight for themselves. Welcome back. We have two more panels to finish out our symposium today. We hope you'll uh, stay with us through them. We're going to cover quite a few of the papers that are in the issue. You'll get presentations that cover the content and a rich discussion afterwards. For this portion of the symposium, if you have questions that you want to direct to any of our speakers, you can use the box uh, right below the screen where you're watching. Uh, I do want to note that it's hard as a moderator to weave in all the questions, so please be patient, uh, but we'll try to get to as many as we can. Panel three is going to focus on racism in healthcare services, while the fourth will look at broader issues of structural racism. And to lead us in our third panel, I turn it now over to Caroline Brunton, Program Officer at the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. Uh, Caroline will be your moderator. Over to you. Thank you, Alan. I'm excited to be with you all today and to introduce our panel on racism in healthcare services. Our esteemed panelists today will draw on their empirical research to discuss racial inequities in healthcare access and use. 
Today's topics will include inequities in access to home health care, geographic access to hospital services, and patient experience in Medicaid, Medicaid managed care plans. I'm going to introduce our panelists um, all together so that we can hear from them each in turn about their research findings and then launch into our discussion, which again includes audience Q&A, so please, if you have questions, drop them in the chat box. First, I'm going to introduce Dr. Shekinah Bashaw Walters, a tenure track professor in the Division of Health Policy and Management at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health. Her focus is on understanding inequities in aging while elucidating and explicitly naming racism as a fundamental determinant of health inequities within long-term care. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Jane Eberth, an associate professor in the Division of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the University of South Carolina and the director of the Rural and Minority Health Research Center. The focus of her research is on cancer health disparities particularly socioeconomic and structural barriers that impede access and utilization to cancer screening and treatment. Finally, we will hear from Dr. Kevin Nguyen, an investigator in the Department of Health Services Policy and Practice at the Brown University School of Public Health, where he completed his PhD in health services research. His work focuses on quality and equity of care delivered to marginalized populations. He is interested in the roles of Medicaid policy and care delivery reform on improving patient experience in the healthcare safety net. Dr. Fashaw Walters, it's over to you. Thanks so much. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure to kick off this panel um, and discuss our study entitled Out of Reach, Inequities in Access to High Quality Home Health Agencies. The purpose of this study was to examine if beneficiaries from racial and ethnic minority groups, low-income beneficiaries, and home health patients living in predominantly minority and socially disadvantaged communities use care from high quality home health agencies at a lower rate than other home health patients. Let's move to the next slide. By way of background and to level the playing field, at the start of this study, we knew that neighborhoods with predominantly minority and low income individuals, that they have decreased access to high quality services, including hospitals, primary care physicians, and nursing homes. Much of our healthcare quality here in the US is measured using publicly reported five-star systems that combine several process and outcome quality measures. For home health specifically, literature reports that home health agencies with high proportions of Black Medicare beneficiaries, Medicare Medicaid duly eligible beneficiaries, and users within low-income neighborhoods are less likely to be rated as high-quality home health agencies and receive the four- and five-star ratings. And we know that receiving care from low-quality home health agencies may result in adverse outcomes. But we knew very little about why these lower-quality home health agencies had higher proportions of minorities and lower income users. Let's move to the next slide. Using uh, the publicly reported home health five-star ratings via CMS Compare, we found that Black, Latinx, or Hispanic, and low-income users are less likely to use high-quality home health agencies after controlling for various patient-level factors. And on average, what you're seeing in front of you is that as the social deprivation or disadvantage of a neighborhood increased, the use of high quality home health agencies decreased. We also found that within the same types of neighborhoods, white and higher income home health users tended to use more high quality home health agencies than did black, Hispanic or lower income home health patients. This same downward sloping or inverse relationship is also observed when looking by the percent of neighborhood uh, residents below the federal poverty line, as well as neighborhood racial composition, whether that be the share of black residents in a neighborhood or the share of Hispanic um, Latinx uh, residents within a neighborhood. 
Furthermore, let's move on to the next slide. We found that some 40 to 77% of the disparities in the use of high quality home health agencies were attributable to neighborhood level factors. And that home health patients in neighborhoods with a greater share of black, Hispanic, or Latinx and low income residents were less likely to use high quality home health agencies. But even when black, Hispanic and lower income home health patients patients reside in neighborhoods with a greater number of high quality uh, home health agencies, disparities in access to high quality home health agencies continue to persist. This illustrates that differential geographic access is not the only cause of the decreased access inequities that we see. These findings suggest that there are robust and pervasive home health access inequities that put high quality home health agency services out of reach, as it says in the title, for the most vulnerable Medicare home health users. We're talking about home health users that are vulnerable because of age, race, income, and we haven't even started to tap into the other isms and intersections of identity that exist. Let's move to the next slide. When considering the possible mechanisms behind inequities and in high quality home health agency use, um, observed within this study, it's difficult to truly separate out the patient-driven and pro pro provider-driven factors. But regardless, uh, differences in patient choice or differences in understanding publicly reported quality information, they're truly unlikely to explain all of the inequities that are revealed within this study, especially given our findings about how much neighborhood-level factors contribute to the inequities equities that we see. Through these findings, we are seeing multiple forms and levels of racism at work. We are seeing interpersonal, structural, and institutional, and hopefully we get to talk about these more during our discussion. This study serves as a call to action for policymakers and Medicare home health program directors to really consider racial disparities and access more readily and put high quality home health agencies into reach for the most marginalized populations, especially Especially considering that home health value-based purchasing is expanding and the Care Compare five-star ratings in home health are continuing to be used. Similar policies and programs within other settings have been shown to exacerbate health disparities. So let's move to the next slide. It's important to incentivize care for historically marginalized groups by incentivizing high quality providers to serve historically underserved groups and even targeting lower quality providers for quality improvement innovations. In our paper, we discuss how providers may decline to serve in certain areas because of their perceptions of safety or high risk neighborhoods. Um, CMS could consider reimbursing home health agencies for the use of clinician escorts or security personnel. These non-medical services so that providers are better able to serve in these high risk areas uh, when they have concerns around safety and hazardous environments. And then another suggestion that we make is that uh, CMS and others work to encourage patients to use the five-star ratings. Perhaps we could work on informing beneficiaries when they're using lower quality home health agencies and making them aware of other choices within their area. I'll pause there and I'll say that I look forward to our discussion. Thanks. Dr. Eberth. Yes, it's a pleasure for me to be on this esteemed panel and to be a part of this. This project, I, I joke, consumed months of my life and I'd have it no other way because it was really the most um, interesting study I've ever worked on. And in addition to this manuscript, I want to point out to everyone that there's an accompanying story map that we developed. So on the landing page of the Health Affairs Special Issue, you can find get access to that story map and really interact with the maps and content we've developed in a much more um, user-friendly way. So I encourage everybody to check it out. Um, and let's go to the next slide. First off, I'd like to start with a brief reflection on the title of this article and our accompanying story map. 
So this is a picture of famed sociologist and the co-founder of the NAACP, W.E.B. Du Bois, which has already been referenced at least once today. And in one of his many writings, he stated, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. And that statement still rings true today. Indigenous people and people of color in the US continue to face structural racism in healthcare and in many other facets of life. Next slide. So one of the central themes of our studying, study and the accompanying story map that you can find on the landing page is that the location where people reside today and the resources that are subsequently available to them in those places is not random. Historical influences put people where they are today. And as you can see in this map, there are specific policies and programs, as well as just the larger sociopolitical context that shaped the US landscape and continues to shape it over hundreds of years. Now, for example, four states, California, Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico are home to 50% of the Hispanic population in the US today. And although those states do border Mexico, so they would naturally have a larger Latino population, because of that proximity, uh, you know, policies also have played a role in that, the location of these residents. So one such example is the Bracero program established in the 1940s that allowed Mexican citizens who were mostly men to enter the country for seasonal work on farmlands and railroads. And many of those families remain in those regions today, including one of the co-authors of our study who is a, uh, has ancestry from the Rosero program. Next slide, please. So in this study, we use zip code tabulation areas to represent local areas. And the zip codes were compared in terms of their racial ethnic makeup. Places in the top 5% or 20th or 95th percentile for each racial and ethnic group were classified as having a high representation of that group in that local area. An area that fell into the top 5% for more than one minoritized group was classified as high for multiple groups. I think you can click a few more clicks and get some additional data here. We stratified by urban rural status to ensure that we would capture both urban and rural places that have a high density of minoritized residents. This was important because as you know, rural and urban places are very different. And so the threshold to reach the top 5% in any particular category is different depending on whether the place is an urban or a rural place. So after we defined areas based on that composition, we calculated distance in road miles between the centroids of those areas and the nearest hospital that had different service lines like obstetric care, ICU, emergency, trauma, cardiac care, and outpatient surgery. Next slide. In the maps you see here, we classified areas by whether they had a high density of minoritized residents and the distance to the closest hospital that had an ER, that's what you see on the left, or an ICU, which is the map you see on the right. For areas that have a high representation of minoritized residents, the longest distances to emergency and ICU care, you can see they're generally concentrated on the northern border of Arizona, southwest Alabama, parts of South Dakota, New Mexico, and Texas. Many of those areas are co-located with designated tribal lands. Regardless of whether an area has a high density of minoritized residents or not, Zictas that were in the West region had the longest median distances to hospital services for all the different types of services we explored. And similar maps for other service lines, if you wanna check out cardiac care, um, card, uh, obstetrics, those kinds of other services can be found in our story map. Next slide, please. Interestingly, we found in this study that minoritized areas had longer distances to care in rural places, but the opposite was true in urban places. Now, this doesn't account for the quality of care, so that's an important caveat to make. This is really focused on distance, so even in an urban place, if a minoritized population has better access, it doesn't mean the access to those services are indeed better quality. Places with high American Indian populations or multiple minoritized groups in the locality have the highest percent with distances longer than 30 miles. That's true in both urban and rural places. Interestingly, also places that were more racially heterogeneous or diverse, which we classify as all other ZICTAs, they have the smallest percent with distances longer than 30 miles. 
So really it's the high white areas as well as these areas with a high density of one racial ethnic group that have the greatest distances. Next slide, please. This is a very similar figure. It's just focused on ICUs compared to ER. We really found very similar things in this and the other figure where minoritized zictas having longer distances to ICUs. This was true in rural, but the reverse was true in urban. Next slide, please. Our team developed a series of regression models also to look at this issue. And once we adjusted for a variety of area level covariates, we found that rural areas with a high representation of black or American Indian residents were significantly more likely than areas that had all white populations to be 30 miles or more from an ER. Rural areas with more than one highly represented minoritized group also had worse access. Next slide, please. There are many state and federal policy levers to consider if we can uh, really commit to reducing inequities in access for minoritized residents. First, we need better state oversight of hospital mergers, closures, and expansion plans. We can consider doing this through uh, modifying certificate of need laws, and there are other uh, policies at the state level as well. When healthcare is being viewed as a capitalistic terms, there's a problem. We really need to shift to a community needs perspective. Second, we need federal entities like CMS to help ensure equity and access to services through policies like network adequacy standards. And I can go more into that during the discussion. Third, we really need to make sure we leverage federal investments. For example, funding from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act should be used to improve transit opportunities and reduce travel times for minoritized communities. And finally, as you saw in our analysis, American Indian communities face some of the worst access to care that we observed in our study. We must do better for indigenous people whom the federal government has guaranteed health care through previous signed treaties. Increasing the funding available for Indian health service programs is the first but not only step we need to take. Next slide. I just wanna thank all these contributors to our study. Um, uh, encourage you to check out our story map and acknowledge the funding from the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy for this work. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, we'll finish up with Dr. Nguyen. Thank you so much. Uh, I am delighted and honored to be a part of this symposium and to have the opportunity to share a bit about our study where we examine racial and ethnic inequities in patient experience of care among Medicaid managed care enrollees. Next slide, please. First, I want to provide a little bit of background. Um, and Medicaid managed care enrollees from racial or ethnic minority groups have historically reported significantly worse access to care, timeliness of care, and satisfaction with care compared to white enrollees. Now, as we all know, these inequities in experience are the product of systemic racism, as well as interwoven patient, provider, and plan level factors. In thinking about measuring these inequities in the context of a health plan, it's really important to think about whether this variation is primarily due to within plan or uh, between plan effects, because this will allow us to inform interventions. Um, so for purposes of de defining, uh, a within plan disparity might indicate that patients from a racial or ethnic minority group would report worse experiences of care than white patients enrolled in the exact same plan. Um, a between plan disparity would indicate that a racial and ethnic minority patient would be uh, disproportionately enrolled in lower quality plans. So the goal of our study was first to measure racial and ethnic inequities in experience of care among Medicaid managed care enrollees. And then we assessed whether these differences were largely driven by within plan or between plan effects. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in the, so we examined four different patient experience of care metrics, but in the interest of time and hopefully to encourage people to read the paper, I'm going to focus on one outcome, which is timely access to specialty care. And so this was defined as reporting um, that you were usually or always able to get an appointment to see a specialist as soon as you needed. So in this bar graph, we estimate total disparities between enrollees from each racial and ethnic minority group and compare them to white enrollees. And in the dark blue, we present within plan disparities. And in the red, we present between plan disparities. Um, so as you can see in this graph, um, compared to white enrollees, enrollees from each racial and ethnic minor minority group were significantly less likely to report timely access to specialty care. Um, and these disparities ranged between 3.6 percentage points for, uh, for black enrollees 
to nearly 20 percentage points for Asian American, Native Hawaiian, or Pacific Islander enrollees. Um, inequities in timely access to specialty care were largely attributable to within plan effects, uh, which again refers to different treatment or access or experience um, of racial and ethnic minorities within the same plan. And um, the patterns were comparable across their other three outcomes, but this particular outcome had the largest magnitude. Um, next slide, please. So uh, the, the main takeaways that I want to highlight for the study is that, first of all, compared to white enrollees, racial and ethnic minority Medicaid-managed care enrollees reported significantly worse experiences of care on all four of our metrics in the study. These differences were largely attributable to within plan disparities. And um, while I wasn't able to um, highlight this in the last slide, one thing I did want to note was that for some outcomes, uh, plans that had higher concentrations of Hispanic or Latino or Asian American, Native Hawaiian, or Pacific Islander enrollees um, had a positive correlation with a smaller magnitude of disparity for these enrollees. So this warrants further exploration as to what these plans are doing successfully to provide more equitable experiences of care. Uh, next slide, please. And so uh, just to synthesize uh, the study and discuss the implications for policy and practice, um, building upon discussions throughout today's symposium, inequities and experience of care are driven by structural racism. And um, what's interesting about this particular work is that Medicaid managed care plans are uniquely positioned to address racial and ethnic inequities in the Medicaid program. Um, some plans have reported a variety of different strategies and prioritization of advancing health equity. And these strategies have included um, adopting health equity performance metrics, um, trying to expand provider networks to be more culturally or linguistically inclusive, uh, directly engaging with enrollees to assess both their health needs and their social needs, um, and to develop uh, plan level quality improvement programs. So um, I think one of the big findings of our study too is that um, Medicaid managed care plans will play an important role in advancing health equity in the Medicaid program because by some estimates, about 70% of Medicaid beneficiaries are enrolled in a managed care plan. But um, it will also require uh, care delivery reform, uh, health policies, social policies, and cross-sectoral initiatives that work to address the underlying inequities that are driven by racism. Next slide, please. With that, I thank you for your time, um, and thank you to Health Affairs for putting together this terrific event, and I'm really excited to have a robust discussion with the other panelists. Great. Thank you so much. Um, once again, I just want to prompt the audience, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them into the chat and we will try and get to them. Um, the first question I'm gonna kick off is gonna be a question for all of you. So much has been made about public insurance programs, uh, mostly Medicaid, but Medicare too, is avenues to racial health equity. All of your studies really suggest that it's not as straightforward as access alone. So where in your research and experience do you see some ripe opportunities to really dig in and address systemic racism in our public health care policy? Well, I'll jump in first just to mention, you know, one of the things that our study noticed is we talked about distance as this metric. and We wanted to see what we could find in terms of differences across groups. And we definitely did find that. But I mentioned didn't look at quality. And in addition to that, it ignores the fact that uh, these facilities that are close by may not be accessible. So I referenced network adequacy. And I think uh, this is a big component of Kevin mentioning, mentioning with uh, Medicaid managed care programs as well. Not every choice is available to you. It may be in or out of network. And so one of the key components I think states and the federal government need to be considering is really how are we ensuring that the options available to patients are high quality and that there are enough options. Having you know, one hospital that's available to you that's far away in network is not appropriate. We need that patient to give patients the choices to go to places that they wanna go to that are uh, culturally competent and have linguistic um, temp uh, alignment. So I think that we really need to focus more on that um, as a policy priority for Medicare managed care plans and just in general public insurance plans. 
I can jump in and add. Yeah, I can ahead. add about Medicare. One of the policy recommendations that we call out in our paper um, is about identifying agencies that are high quality agencies and that are positioned to serve more underserved communities. But I think another way to do this and a very important way of doing this is identifying agencies that are already serving high proportions of black and brown uh, Medicare beneficiaries and working with those agencies to improve their quality because there's probably also a reason why they are maintaining the um, the patient base that they have. And so making sure that we're working with those agencies that are already serving these communities to improve their quality is going to be helpful, I think, to the agencies and the workers themselves, as well as to uh, the Medicare beneficiaries that are using services. And then I will um, jump in and so echoing what uh, the panel has said as well as from the last panel, um, I think uh, somewhere that we could improve is data collection and improvements in data quality. So in our study, we were fortunate that, our, that we relied on patient surveys and patient reported race and ethnicity. Several studies uh, prior to ours have indicated that uh, race and ethnicity data are largely missing in administrative data for Medicaid managed care. Um, so without this data, we are really unable to um, quantify what is missing. Um, and then second, uh, patient experience measures are often reported at the plan or state level. Uh, so another way that we could build upon current efforts would be stratifying um, what is already collected by race or ethnicity. But I would like to know that data quality is necessary but not sufficient for um, advancing health equity. Great, thank you. And I just actually got an audience question about this, Dr. Nguyen. Um, it, says the literature often finds between provider disparities are generally larger than within provider disparities. Are, are you attributing some of that, what you found to the data, the data quality, or is it something else that um, you would attribute some of the difference to? I think that's a great question. And um, I think to this, this question, as well as what our findings suggest is that they're likely very intertwined and it, with our current data, it's hard to disentangle um, what is the primary driver, but I think it certainly is important to continue assessing. Great, thank you. Dr. Fashaw Walters, um, you know, a lot's been made about the care economy lately. And, um, you know, given that the majority of the home healthcare workforce is majority women and there are a large number of black and brown women, um, many of these jobs don't pay well and it's often unsustainable outside of a medical context. So can you talk a little bit more about why it's important to have not only an adequately compensated and supported workforce, for health equity, not just for the patient, but for the workers themselves? Yes, um, I believe that I have a colleague that will be speaking on the next panel that can really talk to the importance of workforce and equity. But will I, what I will say concerning home care workforce, I think it is important to uh, increased reimbursement for home care workers, but reimbursement and, and payment and wages alone is not enough. Uh, there need to be changes also to the other incentives for their care, the benefits that are provided, and upward mobility is really important. I think many of the inequities that we're seeing here in this study come to life, um, and, and what we've seen from qualitative data is really related to uh, more of our skilled nurses, RNs, uh, PTOT, being unable to go into certain communities and serve certain populations. But many of those home aides don't make it to that level, but could have the opportunity if education um, and resources were different. So I do think uh, increasing wages is really important to changing the life of our home care workers, but also uh, the, the beneficiaries that are receiving care. Uh, but there needs to be more than just wages that are being changed. Great. Thank you. And unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, but thank you to our wonderful panelists. And um, I believe I'm passing it back to Alan. Thank you so much, Caroline, and to our panelists for presenting those papers. Uh, we have one more really exciting panel to go today. It's going to look at some of the core elements of structural racism and their relationship to health. 
Uh, I'm pleased to be able to turn it over to Dr. Tyson Brown, Associate Professor of Sociology at Duke, uh, who will be the moderator for this session. Uh, Dr. Brown, over to you. Thank you, Alan, and hello, everyone. Welcome to the fourth and final panel. In this panel, we'll really spotlight empirical research on how structural racism causes racial inequalities in both health and opportunity. And the panelists will illustrate links between different forms of structural racism, including neighborhood police encounters, felony disenfranchisement, and also occupational segregation, and disparities in health and opportunity for minoritized groups. So the panel will also share policy recommendations to address the structural racism at the root of these outcomes. And I encourage viewers to also read the uh, original research articles, which are accessible online. So without further ado, I will introduce the panelists, uh, the first of which is Dr. Kat Thiel, who is a professor at Tulane University School of Public Health, uh, as well as director of the Mary Amelia Center for Women's Health Equity Research and senior director of the Tulane Violence Prevention Institute. Her research focuses on reducing health inequalities by understanding and altering neighborhood environments and social policies for better health in underserved uh, populations, both locally, nationally, and also internationally. And our next panelist is Dr. Patricia Homan, who is an assistant professor of sociology and the associate director of the public health program at Florida State University. She's also an associate uh, at FSU's Pepper Institute on Aging and Public Policy and the Center for De uh, Demography and Population Health. Her research uh, explores how gender, socioeconomic, and racial inequalities in American society shape the health and well being of the population as well as individuals as they age. And our final uh, panelist is Dr. Jeanette Hill, who is an associate professor of health policy and management at the University of Minnesota. Her research focuses on the healthcare workforce with an emphasis on how low and middle skill healthcare workers um, uh, navigate these environments. She studies the use of credentialing and career ladders in healthcare settings to really improve worker skills and quality of care, as well as the rewards to workers uh, for participation. Uh, she also studies the use of low and middle skill workers and care teams across different healthcare settings. And so with that, I will turn it over to our first panelist, um, who is Dr. Kat Thiel. Floor is yours. Hey, thanks, Tyson. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. It's really great to be with you all today to talk about our paper in this very exciting and important issue that we are so excited to be a part of. Um, I am Kat Thiel. I'm presenting on behalf of our Tulane team, shown here, doctors. Samantha Francois, Karen Bell, Andrew Anderson, David Shea, and Dean Thomas Leviste. And this work was made possible from support through the National Institutes of Health, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and CDC as a part of our larger work on violence prevention in New Orleans. I first want to also acknowledge the lens that I bring to this work as one of a heterosexual, cisgender, white, non Hispanic woman without much of the lived experience of the topics I study. Um, I have continued and will continue always to center the voices of those with lived experiences, but I wanna acknowledge that. So in this paper, we examine the association between frequent policing or police encounters and both health and violence related outcomes in a Southern city, the title being neighborhood police encounters, health and violence in a Southern city. We examine this at the neighborhood or census track level and despite the theoretical work on policing and health, there really have been a limited number of empirical studies examining the impact on physical health. Our hypothesis was that frequent policing may be associated with physical and mental health of local communities and also with violence related outcomes, including violent crime, as well as domestic events. It is a cross-sectional ecologic study, so comes with several limitations but again, adds to this growing body of research on the impact of over-policing, as well as police violence and health, as demonstrated by great scholars and experts in the field, such as doctors Ali Sewell, Rachel Hardiman, Jackie Jean, Amanda Geller, Dylan Jackson, and many others. We examine rate of stop and frisk encounters or pat downs in 2018, based on electronic police report data from New Orleans, and we link them to health outcomes, which is based on the CDC's 500 cities database, which is based on the um, Behavioral Risk Factor and Surveillance System Survey with small area estimation allowing for prevalence estimates at the track level. 
We used 911 data here from New Orleans to examine violence related outcomes, including rates of homicide and assault, as well as rates of domestic events. Next slide, please. The setting for this work uh, was in New Orleans, Louisiana, a city plagued by high rates of violence with one of the highest murder rates in the country and even globally. And New Orleans, like many other cities across the US and the neighborhoods in New Orleans were shaped by historic structural violence, including patterns of redlining. And shown here in this map are the redlined areas of the city. And these are the same areas that are experiencing elevated rates of violence, poverty, ill health, and other social determinants, even to this day. So note where these red areas are. And next slide, please. These are the same neighborhoods exhibiting, exhibiting elevated rates of police encounters as shown here in the red. And these events are not spatially random as we described in the paper with significant spatial clustering of encounters across the city. Next slide, please. The rate of encounters was also significantly greater among um, black residents compared to white residents. Um, it was the only way we could kind of break up that data racially, uh, do acknowledge all the diversity within these groups. But as you can see, the rate was substantially higher in, in black residents. And for youth or those under 18, um, police encounters were only observed among black youth in 2018. Next slide, please. In terms of the link with health outcomes um, and violence outcomes, we found that neighborhoods with greater police encounters had higher prevalence, um, a higher prevalence of negative health outcomes and higher rates of violence related outcomes. This is shown here on the left with the top chart representing health and the percentage point differences in health outcomes between neighborhoods with higher and lower uh, police encounter rates and the bottom half of the chart indicating the rates of violence and the difference in violence per thousand population. Compared to neighborhoods with lower rates of encounters, those with higher had significantly greater levels of lower physical activity, poor sleep, poor physical health and mental health, obesity, heart disease, and smoking, with some of the greater differences found in physical activity and smoking. These neighborhoods with higher encounter rates also exhibited higher rates of violent crime and domestic calls, as shown in the figure. And these are also adjusted models. So this is after taking into account socioeconomic disadvantage and racialized income segregation as measured by the ICE or index of concentration at the extremes. Next slide, please. So in sum, this study adds to the emerging evidence linking inequities and in aggressive policing to health and community violence. And while the role of policing is hotly debated, uh, there is a large body of theoretically and empirically based alternatives to community policing. These were outlined in a recent report by the John Jay College of Criminal Justice, a picture shown, shown on the right. And these include changes in physical characteristics of communities, strengthening anti-violence norms and peer relationships, increased youth support, mitigating financial stress, addressing the harmful effects of the justice process, and policies that control access and access to and possession of firearms. So these may be efficacious in not only reducing violence in our communities, but also improving health. Next slide, and I think that's it. Thank you, I look, really look forward to the discussion. Dr. Patricia Homan, she's gonna be discussing her uh, project along with me uh, entitled Sick and Tired of Being Excluded, uh, Structural Racism and Disenfranchisement as a Threat to Population Health Equity. The floor is yours, Dr. Homan. Great, thank you so much. So this paper is in collaboration with Tyson Brown, as he just said, um, and it's really built on the fact that there's a growing body of evidence suggesting that population health is shaped by structural racism, which refers to systemic racial exclusion from power, resources, and opportunities that's embedded in our social institutions. Well, there are many forms of structural racism in the US, but one key type that has received comparatively less attention as a determinant of health is black political exclusion and voter suppression. Next slide. The US has a long history of black voter suppression in various forms. So for example, before the 1965 Voting Rights Act, um, it took the form of poll taxes, literacy tests, grandfather clauses, and other types of tactics to prevent Black people from casting their votes. After these tactics became illegal, 
other forms of Black voter suppression shifted to structural racism in a criminal legal system. For example, mass incarceration, punitive sentencing, and felony disenfranchisement laws. Although felony disenfranchisement may have the appearance of being race neutral, it is nevertheless racialized because it disproportionately limits the voting rights of Black people. Nationally, felony disenfranchisement rates among Black Americans are 370% greater than rates among non-Black Americans, but there's also considerable variability across U.S. states. Next slide. So we created a state-level measure of racialized felony disenfranchisement. It is a disproportionality measure showing the degree to which Black people are overrepresented among the disenfranchised relative to their population size in a given state. Values ranged from 1.5 to 9.4, and the average in 2016 was 3.3, meaning that there were nearly three and a half times more Black people among the disenfranchised than what we would expect under conditions of equity, given their proportion in the population. So the map illustrates the levels of racialized disenfranchisement shown in quartiles for the year 2016 for all states with available disenfranchisement data. Higher values represented by darker colors indicate greater racialized disenfranchisement. The state with the highest was Utah and the lowest was Mississippi. So although the South is known for its legacy of slavery, its current disenfranchisement policies are in fact less racially unequal than many other parts of the US, although they are still far from equitable. Next slide. Previous research and theory suggest that this racialized disenfranchisement is likely to undermine the health of Black people through two main pathways. First, disproportionate Black disenfranchisement weakens Black people's political power and their ability to influence public policies that allocate resources, often unequally, that are going to shape health in their communities. A second way racialized disenfranchisement harms health is through various psychosocial mechanisms. These include feelings of social isolation, low sense of control, stigma, unfair treatment, all of which are part of the lived experience of being a marginalized group and are known to produce physiological stress responses that can undermine health over time. But there's actually very little empirical evidence linking disenfranchisement to health. So our study linked the data on racialized disenfranchisement for each US state in 2016 to geocoded individual level demographic and health data from the health and retirement study in order to examine whether living in an environment of high racialized disenfranchisement has an effect on the health of black and white older adults. The health and retirement study is the most widely used data set for studying health and well being in later life. Our sample consists of roughly 12,000 US adults over age 50 residing in 35 states. Next slide. Here are our results. We studied four different health measures to capture mental health and the physical process of disablement and health decline that happens in later life. These include depressive symptoms, functional limitations, for example, climbing stairs and lifting heavy objects, difficulty with instrumental activities of daily living, which includes things like shopping, cooking, and taking medication, and then difficulty performing activities of daily living, which, refer to, which are often referred to as disabilities. So difficulty eating, bathing, dressing, walking, and getting out of bed. Each panel shows the relationship between the number of health problems on the y-axis and the level of racialized disenfranchisement exposure on the x-axis among black and white adults. So looking at the top left panel, the blue line indicates that as racialized disenfranchisement increases, depressive symptoms also increase among Black adults. The flat orange line indicates that there are no statistically significant associations between racialized disenfranchisement and health among whites. We see this same pattern across all four health outcomes, showing that racialized disenfranchisement is consistently associated with worse health among U.S. Black people. Next slide. In conclusion, our findings suggest that enacting laws that will reduce or eliminate racialized felony disenfranchisement 
can improve the health of Black people and make progress towards achieving health equity. The key implication here is that voting rights are not just relevant for political inclusion and social justice, but also for public health. Voting rights policy is health policy. Thank you. Great, and now we have our last presenter who is uh, Dr. Jeanette Hill, and she'll be discussing her project on structural racism and black women's employment in the US healthcare sector, which was also published in uh, the special issue. Great, thank you. Uh, I wanna acknowledge my co-author on this paper who is Mignon Duffy, who's at the University of Massachusetts Lowell. Uh, and I also um, wanna note that, you know, I'm not a black woman and I've not experienced the kind of structural racism that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, I studied the healthcare workforce and for a long time I've been writing about gender and the devaluation of women's work in healthcare. And in this paper, we extend uh, the, the concept of devaluation to talk about women of color in the healthcare sector and specifically black women. Uh, so in this paper, we argue that structural racism in the labor market linked to historical legacies of slavery and domestic service has had a strong impact in shaping the healthcare workforce. Structural racism is defined as structuring opportunity and assigning value based on race, unfairly disadvantaging some individuals and communities and advantaging others. Structural racism can only be understood by reference to historical processes, as many panelists have talked about today, and we look to the history of care work in the U.S. to understand contemporary patterns. Next slide, please. Before the Industrial Revolution, most of care happened in private homes. Using an intersectional framework that focuses on gender and race, we learned that not only was most care work performed by women, but racial, racialized ideologies also undergirded a division between what the scholar Dorothy Roberts has called spiritual and menial housework. The spiritual side, dominated by white women of privilege, was work that was considered to require moral character and relational skills, serving as a hostess, supervisor of the daily work, or a role model for children. In contrast, the most strenuous and unpleasant tasks, scrubbing floors and washing laundry, caring for the bodily needs of household members, and preparing and cleaning up after meals were thought to require little or no, no skill. This menial labor was relegated to slaves and domestic servants and was ideologically associated with women who are Black, Indigenous, and people of color. The legacy of slavery and high numbers of Black women among domestic servants place Black women at the center of this culturally construction, constructed division of care. Historical studies have shown important continuities in these gendered and racialized patterns as the economy transformed in the 20th century. White women are disproportionately represented in healthcare jobs with supervisory capacity, a public relational element, and some degree of moral authority, like registered nurses or social workers. Women of color are concentrated in the most physically demanding direct care jobs like nursing assistants, licensed practical nurses, and home health aides. Next slide, please. In our study, we find that Black women in particular have unique patterns of employment in the healthcare sector. Black women make up about 6.9% of the labor force in the US and 13.7% of the healthcare workforce, a rate of overrepresentation that is about double. In comparison, white women are overrepresented in the healthcare sector at a rate of about 1.6 times their representation in the labor force. This overrepresentation of Black women translates into healthcare being a key employer for Black women. Overall, more than one in five Black women in the labor force, about 23%, are employed in the healthcare sector. This is higher than any other racial, ethnic, or, and gender category that we measure. Next slide, please. We wanted to understand more about where Black women are employed in the healthcare sector, so we looked across three healthcare settings, hospitals, ambulatory care, and long-term care. We find that among healthcare workers, Black women have a predicted probability of 37% of working in long-term care, 34% of working in, in a hospital setting, and 27% of working in ambulatory care settings. Black women are more likely than any other group to be employed in long-term care in particular, and are the only group for which the predicted probability of working in long-term care is higher than in other settings. Why does this matter? 
Long-term care settings in general pay lower wages, provide fewer benefits, and offer limited upward mobility as compared to acute care and ambulatory settings. Next slide, please. Last, we wanted to look at Black women's employment across healthcare occupations. Here I'm presenting just the predicted probability of working in healthcare occupations for women, and I've excluded men simply to make the table easier to see and read. I've highlighted the LPN and aid column in the table because that is where Black women have the highest probability of being located within the healthcare workforce. Within the healthcare workforce, Black women have a much higher predicted probability of being an LPN or aid. Um, of their predicted probability of being in the, one of these occupations is 42% compared to all other groups. Black women are less likely to be registered nurses compared to white women, Asian women, and women who are another race or ethnicity. Next slide, please. To summarize, we have used an explicitly intersectional approach to demonstrate that Black women's experiences in the healthcare labor force are unique. Black women are more overrepresented in healthcare and more concentrated in the lowest wage direct care jobs, LPN and aid occupations, than any other racial or ethnic group of women and all men. We have argued that there is a continuity between the current position of Black women in healthcare and the historical gendered and racialized division between spiritual and menial care work. Black women work overwhelmingly in healthcare jobs that have been constructed as menial, the dirty work of care, direct care for older, disabled, and ill bodies and bodily functions. This is a modern day incarnation of the division of labor in private homes identified by scholars of slavery and domestic service and is built on the same interplay of structural exclusion and cultural association. Next slide, please. So how do we create policy to address the impacts of racism in the healthcare workforce? We suggest three related strategies, raising the floor for low wage workers, building career ladders within the sector and addressing racism within the pipeline. First, we need policy to raise wages in, the, in direct care jobs in the healthcare sector where workers are most grossly underpaid. This would start with a federal minimum wage increase that is inclusive of all workers, including those in private homes. Another strategy for improving racial equity is to build career ladders within healthcare organizations and open up uh, social mobility within healthcare organizations. And the last is to address cultural assumptions about who should be providing care and to challenge the feminization of care in the United States. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Well, great. Uh, now, if uh, now's a good time for us to kind of pivot and have a Q and A session, I'd just like to thank the presenters for um, discussing these really impressive, new and novel uh, studies, uh, empirical studies on the causes and consequences of structural racism across multiple sectors, ranging from um, policing to the political arena to the healthcare sector. And so, in our remaining time, I'd like to um, have a conversation and dig in deeper and uh, ask you all uh, a handful of questions, and I appreciate everyone who's um, entered questions in the chat. I'd like to begin by um, asking Dr. Thiel a question. Um, Dr. Thiel, you discussed some alternatives to um, community policing for violence preve prevention, and I know that um, some of your work is focused on changing the built environment for reducing violence and improving health. Can you tell us a little bit more about this work? Um, so, for example, you know, what are some of the challenges in trying to address social determinants like the built environment? Yeah, it's a great question, Tyson, and, and great presentations um, to my colleagues here. This is really exciting work. Um, yeah, it is challenging. We are focused on building on the work of Dr. Charlie Branis and others um, changing place. So this falls under the um, you know, changing place for, for crime prevention. And we are conducting a randomized controlled trial now aimed at cleaning up vacant lots and homes for violence reduction, but also health promotion and changing mindsets around health um, through the RWJF culture of health uh, project. And, you know, my colleague, um, Charlie in Philadelphia found substantial reductions in gun violence just from cleaning and greening vacant lots. So there was a 30% reduction in that city. Um, we're kind of trying to replicate the study cleaning up lots, but also vacant homes. 
And we hope to find the same, you know, some impactful results, but it is challenging. You know, I, I teach in the social determinants, we talk about health equity, but actually working across those lines, we have partners in the city government and, you know, we're working in the housing space and code enforcement and sectors that, you know, it, it, it takes time, it takes the dialogue, it takes the buy-in to get health on tables. Mm -hmm. And it takes, you know, just the space to have those conversations about the systems and about how they are connected in seeing the value of, for example, looking at the impact of, you know, blighted property remediation on health. Um, so I think that's probably the biggest challenge, um, you know, anyway, working across the sector. It's easier said than done. So that kind of balance between action and knowledge, uh, you know, the knowledge is there, but actually the doing is, is much harder than we always think when we're on the ground. Um, Absolutely. Thank you. And my next question is for Dr. Homan. So the vast majority of health research focuses on social determinants of health at the individual and also neighborhood levels. Um, can you walk us through the decision to focus on U.S. states and also, you know, what unique information um, uh, can, can we learn about population health from studying the role of states? Absolutely. Yeah. So State laws and policies dramatically shape the entire criminal legal system and its consequences, so affecting everything from the definition of a crime itself to policing to sentencing, incarceration conditions, and disenfranchisement. Um, so for this particular issue, states are especially relevant. But I will also say there's a very compelling new body of research, um, in particular, uh, work by Jennifer Montez and colleagues that shows how U.S. states have become increasingly important institutional actors shaping population health over the past few decades. Um, and also in my previous work, I've shown associations between state-level structural sexism and health. So our new study here adds to this growing line of work by showing that how one key type of structural racism that's manifest in U.S. states can undermine the health of Black Americans. Um, also, a key advantage to a contextual approach like this is it shows the broader spillover consequences of exposure to discriminatory environments, rather than only focusing on uh, personal histories of disenfranchisement, which are certainly important, but it sort of looks at the at more of a community level issue. Right. Thank you. I mean, I may be biased, but I, I couldn't agree more. Um, so my next question is for Dr. Dill. In your article, you outlined policies to address the impacts of racism in the healthcare workforce. And of the recommendations you make, have you seen any implemented successfully? And if so, what made them successful? And on the other hand, if none have been implemented uh, thus far that you know of, um, how can healthcare employers start making these changes? To unmute myself. Uh, I, I would say um, one of the most effective uh, strategies that I have seen used in healthcare organizations is helping uh, lower level healthcare workers access what I would call the nursing career ladder, which provides amazing upward mobility for workers when they gain access to it. So for example, when nursing assistants are given support from organizations to get additional training to become an RN, or then even a BSN, or sometimes they even go on for a master's degree, the difference between what a nursing assistant makes and the kind of career that a BSN has in a hospital and the kind of salary and benefits they have are an, an enormous difference. And uh, that's just a huge leap in social mobility for someone. So those kinds of efforts can um, make a huge difference for individuals, but can also be a, a tool of racial justice within healthcare organizations. And one that is within the grasp of, of uh, you know, healthcare leaders and healthcare organizations. The infrastructure is already there. Great. Thank you. While I've got you, they haven't uh, told me that uh, we're out of time yet. So um, uh, Dr. Dale, maybe I'll ask you another question as long as time permits. And that is, you know, how's the labor market today shaping the healthcare landscape for Black women? Uh, good question. Uh, I am so interested to see where this labor market is taking us. But right now, the labor market um, is, I think, um, making an enormous correction in wages for low wage direct care workers. So we're seeing large wage gains um, at the lowest levels of the labor market 
in the healthcare sector. And this is having um, a big impact on workers of color who are concentrated in these jobs. And, and like I said, I think this is an enormous correction after decades of stagnant and declining wages in, in these jobs. Um, and I hope that it continues. Uh, I, I think it's a really positive change. Great, thank you. And we have exactly one minute left. And so I'll come back to Dr. Thiel. Um, can you elaborate a, a bit more on the mechanisms between police encounters uh, rate in neighborhoods uh, in both health and violence related outcomes? And I apologize, but we really do have one minute. <laughs> <laughs> really quickly. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think for me and, and, and some of our work has shown the impact that um, even indirect experiences of violence can have physiologically. So how it sets multiple stress response systems and how that might lead to health impacts um, is you know, shown in, in many studies. For violence, it's a little more complicated. Um, there is a reciprocal relationship, of course, between police encounters and, and violent outcomes. And, and I think some of it is the physiological impact, the social emotional as aspects, behavior. But I think, you know, there are some theories, um, one being, you know, the lack of weak tie, or the lack of strong ties in a community and community fragmentation and lack of trust and breakdown that, you know, might lead to lower social cohesion and, and perhaps more crime in the long run. Um, the more important, I think, is, you know, is, is power and, and, you know, the disenfranchisement of many communities and um, the lack of economic and other opportunities that can also lead to, to crime and violence. So I'll stop there. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. This has been a really informative panel, and I appreciate uh, you lending your expertise on these topics. Um, I wish we could talk more, um, but I look forward to reading uh, the articles. Uh, well, actually, I've read them, but I encourage everyone else to go and read them <laughs> now that they're up online. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Alan Weil. Thank you, Dr. Brown, so much for leading us through that last conversation and to our panelists. Uh, we always end on time here at Health Affairs, so my comments would be very brief. Uh, we thank you for your interest in our work. You can find much more at our website. I won't recount everything that you will find there. We will post a recording of this event within the next couple of days. So uh, if you enjoyed watching it, please uh, refer your friends. I do want to acknowledge uh, the support we receive from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the California Wellness Foundation, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, the Episcopal Health Foundation, the New York State Health foundation for making this work possible. Uh, we are committed to this topic. We are proud to have devoted an entire issue, but this is not the end for us. It's certainly not the end of the work that's required. Uh, so uh, as we wrap up today, I just want to thank all of you for your participation, for your interest, but also to assure you that uh, there will be more to come. And we also have other activities coming in February, you can see up on your screen, uh, including a Health Affairs Policy Spotlight one-on-one -on -one, uh, interview with Mina Seshamani uh, at CMS. So to all of you uh, who participated in so many different ways in making today possible, I give you my thanks. And with that, our symposium today is adjourned.